It's 701. Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, March 23rd meeting of the Stafford County School Board. This evening meeting at Shirley Heim Middle School in person. I will call this meeting to order. I will have each board member introduce themselves. I will start on my left. Sarah Chase, Falmouth. Emily Young, Garrisonville. Holly Hazard, Hartwood. Susan Randall, George Washington. Elizabeth Warner, Griffiths, Widewater. Irene Hollerback, Aquia District. And Trisha Healy, Rock Hill. This evening, all board members are in attendance, so we do not need an authorization to participate electronically. I will next ask for an approval of the agenda, I believe, with one amendment. Madam Chair, I'd like to make uh, approve the agenda with the amendment to move the consent items to uh, item number four. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously with the amendment to um, move our consent items. Next are our, our school board proclamations. We will start with our first proclamation regarding the proclamation for the month of the military child. Ms. Healy, will you please read that for us this evening? Yes, thank you, Ms. Hazard. And I, I wanna recognize uh, the late Wayne McCosker. <laughs> Former, should I say, because all the time he was on the board, he would read this for us. A proclamation to designate April 21 as the month of the military child. Whereas Stafford County is proud to be home to many children whose parents serve in the military stationed throughout the local region. And whereas April has been designated by the Virginia Department of Education as the month of the military child, which is a special month to recognize and pay tribute to military members and their children for the daily sacrifices made and for their commitment, courage, and unconditional support for our armed forces. And whereas Virginia has one of the highest numbers of military school-aged children in the nation and is committed to being an active participant in the Interstate Compact on Educational Opportunity for Military Children, which facilitates military children transitioning in school systems across state lines, and whereas the children of our service members continue to make significant contributions to schools, communities, the nation, and our commonwealth, despite prolonged and repeated absences of one or both parents, and whereas all of Virginia's public schools remain committed to the care and education of the children of the men and women of our armed forces, and whereas by partnering with school liaison officers, military leaders, educators, and community organizations, VDOE provides the unique support needed for military service members and their families during all stages of transition and deployment. And whereas Month of the Military Child reaffirms our commitment to ensuring excellence in schools, childcare, and youth services to military children who face unique challenges that other children their age never experience. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the School Board of Stafford County that April 2021 is the month of the military child throughout the school division. Adopted by the School Board of Stafford County this 23rd day of March, 2021. Thank you, Ms. Healy. And I um, would like to also recognize, I know that we have done it recently, about how many of our schools have a designation uh, concerning how well we take care of and minister to our um, military families, which I think is a wonderful thing for Stafford County, our proximity to so many of the bases, especially Quantico, but children come um, from many. So I'd like to just thank all those schools and all that our administrators do for the unique needs of our uh, military students and their families. Next, we have our proclamation for School Library Month, one of our um, favorites. So Ms. Hollerback, why don't you take that one away? Sure will. A proclamation to designate April 2021 as School Library Month, whereas school library programs ensure that students and staff are effective users of information, and whereas the school librarian's role is to provide the leadership and expertise necessary to ensure the library program 
is an integral part of the instructional program of the school. And whereas the school board has entrusted our school librarians to teach the skills of locating and using information and to guide and encourage content and recreational reading in every student. And whereas school library programs contribute to the individual growth and development of all students while fostering both excellence and equity in education. And whereas the school librarians of Stafford County have dedicated themselves to work for quality library programs for all students and now therefore be it proclaimed by the school board of Stafford County that April 2021 is school library month throughout the school division. The school board calls upon school administrators, teachers, students, and citizens of Stafford County to recognize and support this action and to participate throughout the month of April in the celebration of school library month adopted by the school board on September, I'm sorry, by Stafford County on this 23rd day of March, 2021. And I'd just like to um, make a note that um, the little bags here that we've all got at our little stations are from Stafford mm. County librarians. So thank you to all of you out there who um, continue to support us. A big thank you to our librarians and our goodie bags. Thank you uh, for all that you do for investing in our students and helping them in research and for the love of reading. So. Moving on to our next item, which is our amended agenda item, which will be our consent items. Uh, there are three. If, is there a motion to move approve? to approve the consent agenda? Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any comments or anybody wishing to remove an item from consent? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Because of the several um, items that were Approved, I will ask Dr. Jones to make a personnel announcement for us, please. Good evening, thank you. This, this evening I'm pleased to uh, recognize Sandra Osborne. Ms. Sandra Osborne will formally become Director of Public and Community Relations, a position she's filled on at, as an interim basis for the last year. Ms. Osborne joined Stafford County in 2019 as a digital communications manager with oversight of all the division's online and social media resources. Since taking the director role last spring, she's led our efforts to keep our families and community informed about our response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the reopening of schools. Prior to joining Stafford, Ms. Osborne worked for the Marine Corps Marathon as an events and communications manager as well as serving eight years in the U.S. Marine Corps as a public affairs representative. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Digital Media and Web Technology and a Bachelor of Arts in Communication from University of Maryland and is a member of the Public Relations Society of America and the National School Board, School Public Relations Association. So, congratulations. Sandra, we're so thankful for you and for all your talent and thanks for making us home and all the wonderful things that you do. So it's a perfect transition into our next um, agenda item is going to be um, our beginning of our special presentations. Our first one is our recognition of our teachers of the year, which Sandra and her team have wonderfully put together, which I think many people have enjoyed seeing personally each of our teachers. So Sandra, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones introduction. Chairwoman Hazard, school board members, and Dr. Jones. Annually, all schools in the division recognize an individual who reaches above and beyond to demonstrate a passion to students and staff and for his or her craft. These teachers of the year are traditionally recognized during an awards assembly. However, we are unable to host an event this year due to COVID-19 restrictions. This evening, we will continue our video series recognizing the school-based teachers of the year and highlighting the impact each has on his or her school community. Mrs. Sheila Miller was selected as the Hampton Oaks Teacher of the Year for many different reasons. She is a positive educator who comes to school every day wanting to do her best to make sure her children learn, both in the virtual and the hybrid environment. Mrs. Miller believes in the importance of providing good quality instruction in the classroom, as well as building relationships with her students and families outside of the classroom. Her colleagues respect her and the mentorship that she provides for them. 
Mrs. Miller has been a great leader on her grade level team, supporting some of our brand new teachers and helping them along the way. For these reasons, that is why Mrs. Miller was our Teacher of the Year. I was very honored to be elected as the Hampton Oaks Teacher of the Year, um, especially in a time such as this one when the, the way we teach, the way we do everything is very different. Uh, the things that are most important to me at being about at Hampton Oaks is I think having the teachers that are new and bring new technological experience into the classroom are very beneficial to be working with the teachers like myself that have been teaching a little bit longer. So it's been a great part of the Hampton Oaks culture is to have the younger teachers mixing with the more experienced teachers. And I think both sets of teachers have lots to um, offer each other to make us all better teachers, especially in a time like this when we're all learning our craft like we're first year teachers all over again. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Nominating Andrea Fwink for Teacher of the Year was so special to me. She is so deserving of this honor. Andrea is my instructional technology resource teacher, but when I tell you that Andrea is the go-to for so many things, you need data, you go to Andrea. You need a Google Meet, <laughs> you go to Andrea. A student cannot log into their Chromebook. She goes to students' homes. She is such a powerful force here. She is a powerful force on our leadership team. When we come together as a leadership staff, Andrea is front and center. She knows these kids. She supports these teachers, and she is fully committed to doing what's best for the Patriots here. She is so deserving of this award, and it was my greatest joy to nominate her. I was very humbled to be even nominated for Teacher of the Year in this particular school year. Um, I feel like my successes are a reflection of the staff's hard work and their successes. I don't think I could be where I am if I weren't working with who I were working with in this building, from administrators to teachers to paraprofessionals to any other support staff that we have in the building. I have been fortunate enough to be able to support our teachers in using technology this year uh, to help engage students in their distance learning as well as those who are working in the classrooms. And I've been able to help them expand their toolbox of tools to help improve student achievement. So I am very blessed and very fortunate to be able to work with the great staff here at Park Ridge. I would not be where I am today if it weren't for the staff that I work with. Thank you very much for this honor. I am truly grateful and humbled. Our Teacher of the Year for Garrisonville Elementary School is Anne Marie Carson, our Gatorific ITRT. Mrs. Carson has been our Instructional Technology Resource Teacher for eight years. She explains every day to our teachers how to best deliver technology instruction to our students while troubleshooting and doing whatever is needed for everyone here in our Gator community. Mrs. Carson has been an integral piece of our virtual learning experience this past year. We are forever indebted to her expertise and her Gator spirit. We appreciate all that she does, not only for our school while we're here in the building, but in our community relations with our website and social media as well. We are honored to have Mrs. Carson represent Garrisonville Elementary School. My name is Anne Marie Carson and I have been the Instructional Technology Resource Teacher at Garrisonville Elementary for the past eight years. My role as ITRT is to work with staff and determine the ideal way to integrate technology to meet the needs of their individual classroom. The great part of my job is that I get to work with both students and staff. I have worked with some of the most talented educators in the profession. Working together as a family, we give our Gators an elementary school experience that not only prepares them for their future, but also creates memories of fun and friends. To say that I'm proud of my staff would be an understatement. They have been open to embracing these new technologies that we never imagined we would be using. From concurrent teaching to breakout rooms, Google Meet, their determination to reach our Gators to help them succeed in new learning environment is outstanding and it shows they are capable of so much. I believe every single person in this building 
should be Teacher of the Year. That's why it means the world to me to be nominated by my staff. My name is Greg Mackey. I'm the principal of Montreal Elementary School. And I'm really honored here today to uh, pay tribute to one of our teachers, Ms. Jessica Tipple, who is our current uh, Teacher of the Year here at Moncure. Um, I have a few comments that I'd love to make um, about her. Number one, um, Ms. Tipple was just born to be a teacher. She's enthusiastic. She approaches every day with one goal, and that's to help kids leave better than they arrive. She's that teacher who meets uh, kids at the door. She's praising them throughout the day. Um, and at the end of the day, she's there to pump them up for the next day and get that work done as well. Um, she, she has a genuine interest to help our staff as well. And that's also one of her amazing tributes. She is one of our team leaders. Uh, and she is big about knowing her curriculum and supporting her team and helping them along the way. She's been a part of a, she's leading a younger team inside of our building right now. And so helping them to understand what needs to be taught, how to differentiate, meet the needs of our kids is a huge aspect as well. Uh, whenever Ms. Tipple was given the honor of being Teacher of the Year, a couple of our, teach, our parents spoke up um, about her. And um, like one parent really stood out to me when he said that she's a selfless teacher who gives, she gives of herself, she puts everybody else first. And she is that teacher who, um, the exact quote, would reach the overlooked student um, and make them feel special. And again, we're just super excited to have Ms. Tipple as our representative for Moncure's Teacher of the Year. Um, thank you so much, Moncure family, for nominating me as Teacher of the Year. I feel so privileged. There were so many great nominees um, that were alongside me, and I am so honored that I got this privilege. Um, a lot of times, it's not just me, it's the community, and you all have built me up for this with professional development, with helping me along, getting me through some hard times, getting me through the fun stuff. It um, has been a lot of fun, and I have enjoyed being part of the Moncure family. I'm so excited for this nomination, and it's War Teacher of the Year for Moncure. Thank you all so much, Moncure family, for nominating me. Uh, we are very proud at Shirley Hine to have selected Hannah Kassebaum as our Teacher of the Year. Hannah was selected because of her outstanding teaching ability, she's the lead of our seventh grade, as well as her contributions to our, our community. During the pandemic, Hannah was handing out food both at our school and participating in the cookout cookouts with the Stafford Food Security. She also was the first to volunteer to take items to students' homes when the students didn't come by to pick things up. She brought items from their lockers. She's brought textbooks. She's brought novels that they need to read. She has gone above and beyond any other teacher at this time. And we're very proud that she not only was our representative, but she was also one of the top three selected by the county as Teacher of the Year. I was truly really honored to be chosen as Teacher of the Year here at Shirley Heim Middle School. Um, it's so wonderful to be recognized by my coworkers and my peers, especially because there are so many great teachers who are here with me. We all work together so well to meet the needs of our students, to meet them where they are and help them to achieve their goals, whether in the classroom or outside of the classroom. I think we really strive to build an environment that is safe, that is supportive for teachers and for students as well. I believe that education is all about helping to uh, help students meet their goals and to really improve and be what they want to be. So I just want to thank you so much for this honor. Shelly Jones has been a teacher at Gale Middle School for the past 18 years, in addition to teaching world geography. Ms. Jones also is our athletic director, our head field hockey coach, our head track coach, and she also serves on our school's leadership team. In preparation for the celebration of Ms. Jones and her recognition as the Gale Teacher of the Year, I asked her students to share with me the first word that came to their mind when they thought about Ms. Jones. The following is their top 10 list as they provided it to me. Ms. Jones is inviting, kind, fun, interesting, relatable, fair, calm, supportive, open, and trustworthy. Students, I couldn't agree more. Over the past 18 years, Ms. Jones has taught thousands of students in the Gale community. Her passion for teaching history, 
and her love for our Panthers is evident in every interaction she has with students, parents, and colleagues. Congratulations to Ms. Jones. This recognition is very well deserved. Thank you for serving our school community with Panther pride. I teach uh, eighth grade here at Gale Middle School. Um, I'm very uh, honored for the recognition of Teacher of the Year. Uh, I'm grateful to work at a school uh, with administrators who recognize our strengths and provide support and encouragement when we need it. Uh, I'm also very humbled by the recognition of my colleagues. Uh, again, everyone is just supportive. Uh, we make each other laugh uh, when we need, we need that kind of moment. Um, everyone's here to listen and offer support, share ideas. Um, we have questions about how to help our students, to engage our students. Uh, I try to keep it, uh, everything organized. I keep it simple. Uh, I find that um, my students succeed if they know uh, the routine. And um, I know there's chaos outside of school that we can't control, but I try to make my uh, classroom a very inviting, uh, just a comfortable place for students to learn. And uh, I've learned it's best to listen first and then talk second. And again, um, and just, I get to know my students outside of school. I, uh, I tell them my interests and I ask them about theirs. Um, and I just try to get to know them and then uh, just to find ways that, uh, that I can help them. Uh, thank you very much for this honor. We are very excited here at Stafford High School to have Miss Woodside as our Teacher of the Year. Miss Woodside demonstrates what we value in our community every day with the tribe. Trust, respect, integrity, betterment, and effort. Miss Woodside is an excellent teacher in the classroom, but she also values the importance of building relationships and doing what's best for kids outside the classroom. She's a winner every day inside the classroom and also supports our students outside the classroom to be the best that they can be. Again, we're very proud of Ms. Woodside here at Stafford High School. So what does it mean to me to be Teacher of the Year? This is a strange year for all of us, and to say I was surprised um, is an understatement. Um, there's so many teachers in this building that deserve this, not just me. So, so many teachers this year have had to step up and step out of their comfort zone, and nobody has complained. Everybody has gone forward with their job um, and learned new technology, learned new ways to reach students. Um, the math department in particular, we work extremely well together and have helped each other through this um, unprecedented time. So thank you so much for this honor. Um, it was definitely a surprise and I appreciate it. Congratulations to these teachers of the year. We will continue presenting the video series over the next two regular school board meetings. Thank you. And an extra shout out to, of course, Sandra Osborne, our now Director of Communication. <laughs> so thank you. All right, moving on to other great things going on in our schools. I'd like to recognize Mr. Boatwright and Mr. and Dr. Greider to come forward to talk to us about A.G. Wright Middle School. Good evening, Dr. Chair, mm -hmm. members of the board. Dr. Jones. It's my pleasure this evening to spotlight one of our middle schools, A.G. Wright Middle School. You all know Mr. Boatwright. He does a great job with his students and with his staff and recognizing his students. But he's very humble about all the things that he does to give back to the community. And there are so many opportunities that his students have uh, to give back. And we are all very proud of Mr. Boatwright and his staff. So thank you, Mr. Boatwright, for agreeing to present tonight. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Jones, members of the board. My name is William Boatwright, and I'm the principal at A.G. Wright Middle School, home of the Tigers. Um, what you'll see in some of these slides are pictures that are pre-COVID, post-COVID. So there's some masks. If not, we probably couldn't do, we, well, we couldn't do this today, but so uh, bear with me as we go through this. The A.G. Wright community is proud to share with you a glimpse of what we do in our community. Um, when you ask what makes A.G. Wright special, I will tell you it's the people. It's the students, the teachers, the staff, the cafeteria workers, our bus drivers, our amazing front office people, our administrators. It's the people that make A.G. Wright what we are. I'm amazed every day about the extraordinary efforts for the people that, that work in our schools. They make up the fabric of who we are. I'd like to share with you a few slides of some of the amazing things that we do at A.G. Wright. You know, when Dr. Greider asked me to do this, I said, 
Well, I don't know that we do anything special. We just kind of do what we do. We're, we're pretty normal in that respect. Until I had an opportunity to go back and, you know, I, I pull out my cell phone a lot and I take a lot of pictures. And when I had an opportunity to go back and look through some of those, there's some things that the folks at AG Wright do that are truly amazing. So, you know, you heard the Teachers of the Year just a few minutes ago talk about how hard this year has been, not only on our, the adults, but on our students and your school principals. And I will say this, and sometimes it might get me in trouble, but I got into this business to work with kids. Adults aren't exactly my thing. I deal with adults because I get to work with kids. And if you didn't notice, somewhere about March, kids went home and they didn't come back. And I had to work with a lot of adults. So somewhere around um, October, November, I had to come up with an idea. And when I say I have an idea, people around my school start to run. Because that usually means work for somebody. Usually not me. I'm the pretty face of the operation. So we came up with the student of the week. We got a, a company to produce some signs for us. And essentially what student of the week is, we gave teachers the opportunity to nominate students. We didn't give them any criteria because we didn't want any one particular student to be student of the week. We left it to the teachers. We gave them a form, a Google form, that they nominated a student and they had to provide a description of what they wanted or why that student was selected or nominated by them for student of the week. I got a committee of folks together, took students' names out, gave them the descriptions, and they selected a student of the week. At that point, I got in my white truck with my two assistant principals and we drove around the students' home. And we presented them with a certificate and a sign that they put in the yards. And um, for some students, we only could meet them at school. But for some, we got them at their homes with their parents. At the risk of sounding a little, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I got more out of that than the students got out of that, to be real honest. I will tell you a quick funny story. We pulled up to one of our students' homes. And it's not one of the students that's listed here, that's pictured here, so I won't embarrass any of them. But when we pulled up, the students don't know we're coming. We call the parents and we arrange to come, and they know we're coming. We ask them not to tell the kids because we want to make it a surprise. So we pulled up to this one young man's house who was a eighth grade, excuse me, a seventh grade student. And he was out on the porch. And parents weren't there, weren't outside at that time. So we pull up in the yard and he recognizes my truck. And so as we get out of the truck, he sees us coming. He jumps off of his chair and runs into the house. <laughs> he's thinking oh my gosh my whole administrative team's here what did I do so it ended up being pretty cool but you know we've gone to houses where parents where students needed it where parents needed it where it was just a, a, a great event we've had parents that have cried because that's the only time the students have ever gotten an award or recognition from school and we've had parents that were we took days off from work because they just it's important to be there to see their kids get an award. So that, that, that was fun. Now, pop-up prom shop. You would think that this is about young ladies from high schools coming to pick up a dress for prom for their high schools. Well, it is, but it's more than that. It's so much more than that. It's amazing that the young ladies who were selected to work in the pop-up pop prom shop are students in our building who may lack self-confidence, may lack, you know, in, in some other areas. They um, need to develop confidence and learn of positive, you know, peer relationships. They develop business skills, and they have a lot of fun in the process. Essentially, this is a mentoring project with some of our teachers. It takes some young ladies that they feel can benefit, and they work with them through the course of the year and ended up where they'll end up with, you know, leasing dresses to students for, who need them in high school. But our students leave there with a greater self-confidence in themselves. Our young ladies, are, are, they do well and they really enjoy this. They come back year after year to help out and they mentor other young ladies. They give back. Kindness Week. We have Kindness Week, and this is one of those pre-COVID things that we used to do. And essentially, we take our whole student body 
and we formed, we formed the peace sign about three years ago. We had Dominion come over and bring a truck, and the Dominion driver was an A.G. Wright alum, with, who, and uh, take some pictures for us. Um, but this tell this we demonstrate for our kids what kindness looks like. We take it for granted that our kids know that, but not every kid comes from the same household that we all come from. And we have to demonstrate what that looks like, what it means, and give them positive reinforcement when they show those behaviors. So. One of our academic successes that I think is phenomenal. Two years ago, you guys um, approved for our school division to receive a, a, pre a program called Read 180. Read 180 has meant the world to our school. These are some pictures of teachers with students working on Read 180. And I'm going to tell you that Read 180 is for students who are three plus years behind in, on grade level or reading. These are kids who don't like to read. These are kids who, if I had to pick it, they wouldn't do it. If we tell them to read, by, read silently, they would sit and look at the page. These are kids who are in danger, that if we don't get them up to grade level before they get to high school, and if any of my teachers are watching, they're gonna roll their eyes when I say, when a kid leaves me, I need them to have the ability to walk across the stage four years later. If they're not reading on grade level, they may not have that opportunity. So we, we took the challenge. My reading specialist, and I say my, and I shouldn't say that, the reading specialist that I work with, Ms. Diegas, is the head of our program. She is a phenomenal human. She and our teachers, I think we got the right folks on the bus. They work with our students, and I will tell you that of the students who are three or more grade levels behind who take the Read 180 class, 60% of them have shown an improvement in reading this semester. That's phenomenal. Those are kids who, that's life changing for some of our kids. Of the students who uh, are taking that this semester, 33% of them have grown at least one year this year, this semester. That's phenomenal. Those kids have made growth. That means they're going to grow them more than one year maybe two years this year, so they're catching up. They can't grow one year when you're three years behind. They have to grow more than that. 13% of our students have done so well that they exited the program, they've graduated. That means they have gone so far as that they're reading on grade level and they are now out of the program and they're back into, their, they're back into another elective and we do spot checks or temperature checks, what we call them, to make sure they're doing okay. Now, when they graduate from our program, we have a celebration. This year, we uh, had the students um, met with them virtually, with them and the, with the students and their parents, their families. So this is the family award. These kids have done something that they didn't think they were capable of doing. And we want to celebrate those who helped them do it. So with them and their parents, we celebrate. And each of the kids who graduates from the program receives a book. Here's a copy of it. It's called the Playbook written by Kwame Alexander. By the way, he's a fellow Hokie, <clears throat> just in case. Uh, and the, the playbook is actually a 52 motivational stories that's written to help inspire, motivate students. Um, it talks about athletics, but it also talks about life. And how do you win at games? How do you win in life? And hopefully that's motivating to them. Mrs. Diegas, the teacher of that student, and even I get an opportunity to leave a student a message in that book that we hope they'll keep with them for life. I'll tell you that, and I always tell stories with stories, um, during our last um, celebration, one of the young students who lives with his grandmother, we called them and they got online and grandma says to us as she's crying that she's never received a call that was positive for her kid, or never received an award, I should say, that was positive for her kid, because he's always been behind in something. This is a kid who now will walk across the stage in four years. You don't know what you did for that kid, but thank you by purchasing that program. School is so much more than just the X's and O's of education and academics. In AG Wright, we believe in community partnerships. And that partnership doesn't mean that we take from our community. It means that we're a part of our community. And it's my hope that our students will learn to volunteer at this age so they will continue that when they're adults, so they will do it when they're older, when they 
they just don't think about it anymore. And we volunteer with the hopes that we don't get it with the idea that we don't expect anything in return. These are some pictures of uh, things that we do at, uh, that we've done in our school. Um, this is my office with all the potatoes and with the mac and cheese. And actually, I, I stepped. Garrisonville Elementary is attached to AG Wright, and the principal there, Miss White, I think she's part magician. I leave my office for more than 20 minutes, and when I come back, it looks like this. Uh, one, one year with the mac and cheese, my door frame was framed in mac and cheese, and I couldn't get in. Um, so I had to dig my way into my office. Um, but what, 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 this, um, what we do here is that Thanksgiving, we have a collection. Um, and what, I've, what AG Wright's invited other middle schools and elementary schools to collect one item, uh, one particular item. A.G. Wright, for years, has collected instant potatoes. Garrisonville collects mac and cheese. Some other schools collect rice, beans, you name it. One school collects cranberry. Now, you can't change. Once you've given a school an item, don't change it because there's a, there's a problem, and you might pay for that. But the hope is that at the end of the day, when we collect all those things together and donate them either to the food bank, Fredericksburg Food Bank, serve, um, is that all those things come together to make a meal. The high schools collect the proteins, which is the turkeys, the uh, hams, and such, and that we collect the meal. So we've kind of organized that for the last several years. We've been able to feed about six or 700 families a year who have a need through our program. And all it is is that we get schools to bring in, whether it's a dollar can of green beans or 50 cents or what have you, but every donation counts and helps to feed our community. So it's a donation to the community with nothing that we expect in return. These are some more of those same photos. Our AG Wright newsletter is new to us this year. I had a student, young lady, um, who came, who sent me an email, and she would not leave me alone. She really wanted to write to have a newsletter. So we did. Mr. Sabah, one of our first year English teachers, um, sponsored the group, and they create the newsletter. This doesn't do it justice. If you ever have an opportunity to go to the AG Wright webpage, Look at the newsletter there. It is visually beautiful. The kids do a phenomenal job of writing it. So students from AG Wright, and there's also one student from Rodney Thompson Middle School who uh, asked to join and was allowed to join with our kids, and they write the newsletter. They do it all collaboratively in a virtual setting, and they do a phenomenal job. They edit it. They write it. I look at it before it's released, but they do a phenomenal job with our newsletter. So... I want to thank them for what they do there. Not many middle schools can say they have a film festival annually. We can. AG Wright has a film festival um, annually. Our film club has produced five feature films. They're all on IMBD. And if you don't know what IMBD is, I didn't either until I, I supposed to have known like years ago, but I really didn't. I just kind of went with it. Um, so when I was preparing for this, I actually had to look it up and see what it meant. It's not that bad. It's, in, it's the internet movie database. I had no clue. I actually told the sponsor, so I dimed myself out. But we've hosted uh, films from local schools. So all the area schools that choose to produce um, local films, produced by their students, um, they write them, they direct them, they film it, they edit it, and they finish the finished product. And we have a film festival that lasts about three days, and it's um, usually it's hosted at one of the high schools in the auditorium. It's phenomenal, but it's all kids sponsored. It's all kids that work. Some of our graduates now are in film school because they started the programs at AG Wright. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Pink out. Yes, sometimes I do dress a little funny. Well, I dress a little funny a lot, but um, pink out is, is our effort that we did a mashup, as our kids call it. Of we, it's our effort to combat bullying and support breast cancer awareness all at the same time. Some, some of you have participated in Pink Out. Some of you have been parents at AG Wright and seen your kids off to school wearing pink tutus and whatnot. We have activities for staff and students. Usually it's a big spirit week and have theme days. And we collect funds. Students will donate funds to uh, wear crazy hats to school on a certain day. Teachers will donate money to wear a t to buy a t-shirt and to uh, dress in jeans. Teachers will do a lot for jeans. 
and all the proceeds we give to the breast cancer research, um, the breast cancer research foundation. Sadly enough, breast cancer has been one of those things that's uh, impacted our school in a negative way. It's, it's, it's had an impact on our school. Veterans Day program at AG Wright is, is special. Um, it's a community event. A social studies department will organize students to write and present as speeches about their personal and the careers of people who are military, who are personal to them and in their lives, it means something to them. Um, our work and family studies department will prepare and serve um, food or, or snacks for our, our guests. And our band, chorus, and strings will play the national anthem and the armed forces medley. And please do not leave out the Coast Guard when you do that. We did that once. That won't happen ever again. Um, donations are collected for the Wounded Warrior Foundation, and we make a donation of approximately, uh, to date, about $2,000 in the name of Drew Broadstone and Kurt Southwick, <coughs> who were both teachers at AG Wright, and uh, they both served in the Marine Corps. They're both are deceased. This board, um, years ago, allowed us to name our library the Kurt Southwick Library after Mr. Southwick. Eighth grade farewell. This is an opportunity that I'm not sure if our teachers or students look more look forward to more than anybody else. This is at the end of the year after the exams are over. It gives our students an opportunity to come together one last time. We take a picture with AG, AG Wright as the backdrop, but our kids do some, they have a ball. They have a barbecue. They uh, played something called Gaga Ball, which I had never heard of before in my life until we built a pit, and now it's uh, it's the rage. I still don't know how to play it, but I guess the kids love it. Um, you know, dunk tanks, the world, the works. We also uh, cook, and I hear the chef there is a two-star Michelin uh, award-winning chef. Uh, so I've been told. I will tell you one of the casualties this year, and I'll use my own daughter as an example. She's a ninth grader this year. Since she was started kindergarten, she had come to AG Wright after school every year, and she was there for eighth grade farewell. Well, I would never let her participate because she wasn't in eighth grade. You know, go to, you go hang up in the office, and I'll be with you when it's time to go home. So this past year was her eighth grade year. Guess what we didn't have at A.G. Wright <laughs> in eighth grade farewell? Guess whose daughter reminds him on a daily basis that he did not have her eighth grade farewell and asks how is he going to make that up? I don't have an answer just yet, but we'll figure that out. So, um, so at AG Wright, we believe that we can get students um, to create a habit of volunteering now that throughout their lives, they'll continue to do it. That in our NJHS um, uh, volunteers, and this is some photos of, of our NJHS as they prepare over 700 lunches a year for MICA Ecumenical Ministries in Fredericksburg. MICA serves lunch to, uh, to home to our homeless population. Some of them have jobs, but they just can't afford to feed themselves daily. So they'll we'll bag lunches, take them down to MICA, and they serve them to them throughout the year. And our NGHS with our sponsor, Mrs. Mills, has taken that on as a personal responsibility, and we bag lunches uh, several times a year for MICA. AG Wright has donated to the United Way approximately $15,000 since 2016, and we're not one of the larger middle schools. We supported more than 350 families through the Angel Tree Project, with providing more than $43,000 in funds and supplies, excuse me. In addition to meal collections for the division level, our school has served Thanksgiving meals to over 100 families in our school. Tammy Robinson, who's our school social worker, heads up our efforts, and she works like you would not believe. She incorporates her parents. She incorporates anyone. I remember driving in one, one year when we had school was closed and we had our maintenance guys plow one strip around the bus ramp so we can get in so that we can give our families the uh, Christmas baskets that they, they needed. We do a casual for a cause. Casual for a cause is an opportunity for teachers to pay five bucks, they get a sticker, and they get to wear jeans on any day other than Friday, because Friday you can wear jeans to work. 
we take those five dollar donations and we pull up pull that money and we make and we give donations to different um, charities, usually those that the teachers have a personal connection with. And so at, uh, to date, we've donated over ten thousand dollars for five dollar pair of jeans to different charities throughout, including the Ronald McDonald House uh, and, and many many other charities. Our folks have contributed over ten thousand dollars to the Breast Cancer Research Society. Because, it, again, as I it said, it's impacted our school. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for, uh, for listening to me and allowing me to brag a little bit about A.G. Wright. I will tell you that there are some phenomenal, outstanding people that work there, and I couldn't be prouder to be the face of that organization. Thank you so much. As a Tiger parent, I can say that... Mr. Boatwright's white truck is infamous. So, every and I'll second that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's been there. Thank you for sharing. It's so nice to hear about what's going on in our schools because um, there's so much great stuff going on. So, uh, next on our agenda is going to be our presentation about our on site instructional plan for all grades for the fourth quarter. Um, Dr. Jones, I don't know if you want to give any intro or um, turn it over. I would ask board members, I believe we will be having three separate presentations. I would ask that you let the presenter get through their, their individual um, section, like elementary, uh, secondary, and then high school. But if you could just jot your questions down after, especially for Ms. Neely, for her, and then we'll ask then if that's all right. All right. Quite honestly, I don't think uh, Ms. Neely needs an introduction. She's mm -hmm. been a frequent visitor and then followed by Dr. Greider and uh, Dr. Nipper. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Madam Chair, school board members, uh, it's my pleasure to share with you our updated learning plan. Even though it's really difficult to follow Mr. Boatwright on one hand, on the other hand, I think he did a great job setting the stage for how important it is for all of us to get our students back to school. So thank you to Mr. Boatwright for that. So we're gonna jump right in. Oh, it looks like we might have an old slide up instead of my new one. So I'll give Mr. Campisi a moment. It has our date on it, Mr. Campisi, the one I shared today. It's coming up. We'll we'll get that corrected for you. The act, actually the um, the first slide looks very similar. It just has the date on it of uh, three twenty three. There we go. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, and you guys can follow along. And you all have copies of this as well. But we are aiming for Tuesday, April 20th, for our start date for implementation for bringing all of our students back to school four days a week. That would be Tuesday through Friday. And uh, just to know that now in progress, our teachers and our elementary folks are busy planning all that is involved to bring students back. Everything from technology to logistics, uh, to working with transportation, finding out the needs of parents and students. So we're super busy right now. Uh, the wheels are turning to put this in motion. On April 6th, we will have more students back four days a week as we have Several schools who are piloting. Again, we already have over 800 students who are back currently four days a week. And just as a note to get ready for that transition, on April 16th, we will have an asynchronous day. That's a Friday. And that will give us a Friday. And then, of course, that Monday is an asynchronous, asynchronous day because we have a lot of furniture moves that we still need to make. We're still measuring classrooms and and taking out furniture as needed. Uh, shout out to 
Mr. Anderson, Mr. Fulmer for helping us make that happen. Our early childhood, uh, we're excited to have a schedule beginning the 20th that will look more like our traditional early childhood model, um, specifically a half day for our students that are early childhood education. Um, in the Traditionally, we have a half day in the morning, half day in the afternoon. So we're excited to get back to that more typical schedule for our early childhood. For our elementary schedule, you also see a more typical schedule, and I've kind of laid that out. Of course, the time is somewhat approximate depending on time changes in a school, and we've given them the flexibility to make decisions based on both their data and um, their transition times, things like that. You'll notice that we have specials and science and social studies included. Uh, we're really excited to be able to have that face-to-face -face special time and to include more intentional science and social studies face-to-face -face as well. We'll continue to have Mondays as primarily asynchronous. We may still hold some small group work on Monday, and homework will also support that four core area. So our work that we know is very valuable, for example, in Dreambox and Lexia for students who are maintaining that recommended daily um, individualized support. We want to see them continue that because we have data that shows it makes a difference for them. So we do want them to continue that. And then just some of the logistics that I know you're probably wondering about. We'll obviously continue to be wearing masks. Uh, hand washing is, continues to be an important mitigation. We have our cleaning, contact tracing. Uh, now we know that we can move to our three to six foot physical distancing to the greatest extent possible. Of course, when we have physical activities, we move that out to six to 10 for um, both physical activities and possibly for things like chorus or band, any kind of uh, time where aerosols are emitted more frequently. We will have breakfast and lunch at school. And so uh, we'll continue those free meals and we'll, we will need to um, continue six foot distancing when students are eating. So even though we can move to a three foot when masks are on, when masks are off, we need to maintain the six foot distancing. So we have schools who are working out the logistics of that right now. We kind of have a combination of schools who can and possibly do portion of that in the cafeteria or in a gym if it's vacant, or maybe half of the students eat in the classroom, half might eat in another setting. So depending on the layout of the school, we've given them flexibility knowing that they have to have the six foot distancing. So they're busy at work with their staffs to um, figure that out. And uh, finally for buses, we know that this is a major factor for us in ensuring that all students get to school and Dr. Kisner has been adamant that we don't want transportation to be an issue for a student not being able to come back. We are going to move to a three foot distancing when possible on school buses, but we may need to move to stu two students per seat on a bus in some situations. I, don't, I can't tell you how frequently that might be right now. We're gathering that data, working with transportation to work out the details. Students will continue obviously to wear a mask, which we know is a major mitigation um, for us. And again, I think uh, Mr. Boatwright did a great job of setting the stage for our why, but we are super excited to have our friends back. Um, these are our students from our schools, and we know that we are just as excited to see them as hopefully they will be to return to us four days a week. So at this point, I'll turn it over to my colleagues in secondary. Ms. Neely, stay there for just a second in case sure. there are any questions from the board. Dr. Oh, Chase, sorry, I thought to... I was waiting until the end. I know, you're trying. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. So I had um, several questions, and maybe they'll be the same as what some of the other folks had. So um, which schools are going to be piloting starting April 6th? So for April 6th, so piloting, we have schools piloting different kinds of, of things. For schools that would be piloting K through five, uh, we're looking at Widewater and Kate Waller Barrett, but we have Stafford L piloting various uh, teachers at different grade levels. We have Conway piloting kindergarten. 
We have Rock Hill piloting uh, first and second grade. Um, sorry, kindergarten first and second grade. And we have Anthony Burns piloting second grade. So you see we have some different things going on. And Garrisonville is actually doing a K-5 as well, but they're able to maintain a six-foot distancing, so they didn't really have to wait until the 20th to do that. And then um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, and if I'm wrong, let me know, that there will still be some students whose families have decided they want to maintain 100% virtual. How is that being done? So they're mainly one of two ways. Hopefully I'm not forgetting any mixture they're in, but uh, you know, we have a concurrent model that our teachers are learning about that technology, so that might be a possibility. We also may have a teacher who continues to teach a full virtual class load, so that might be an option as well. And we've really left that up to the schools. Again, we're trying really hard not to have to change teachers because many schools had to do that once already this year. But it really, you know, it's a combination of trying to... Um, you know, work with staff and families to, to make, you know, the best situation for each student. And then, um, so has a questionnaire gone back out about which students are going to opt to come back for four days a week and about transportation? And are we letting parents know that it's possible if, if their child rides the bus, they may be less than three feet away from other students? And do we have any concerns about that from an equity perspective? So what we are doing, um, so we have gotten that information. It hasn't necessarily been um, accessed through a, a survey. Some schools may have done that as a first round, but most schools have had teachers call home and gather that information for his or her classroom because, you know, parents have questions and teachers can answer that directly. So we found that to work very well. Of course, there's still some families we're, we're still reaching out to. Um, and we will be having town hall meetings again, so we'll have an opportunity to share all of the things that I've just shared with you with our families. Our principals are very committed to being transparent with our families about you know, all the things that, you know, what school will look like when children come back. So, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we're just really trying to, when we notice there's an issue for a family, we are trying to work with that family uh, to help them make the best choice. And of course, we will have some families who still, for whatever reason, aren't comfortable yet sending their students back. But we don't want transportation to be a reason that students can't come. And we do know a thank you to our community because we have had many parents who volunteered to help us Obviously, the less buses that we can have that are, you know, coming closer to that distancing, that, that would be our preference. But we also don't want it to prohibit us from sending school, children back to school. Over here, second. Go ahead, Bill. Um, yes. So I'm not going to repeat the questions that um, Dr. Chase already um, asked, so I'll just skip those. But... Um, when you say, I'm going to try to be as clear as possible, right? When you say school four days a week for the fourth quarter, is it about the days or is it about the, the hours of, per day? So it's both. You, the hours would be, currently we have a three-hour day with a two-hour um, work time in the, or two-hour synchronous instruction for students who are virtual, right? So if I'm teaching... I'm teaching my students three hours in the hybrid model if they're face-to-face -face in front of me. And then in the afternoon, I teach the other half of my students for two hours. Because remember, we had a concern that teachers weren't meeting with students every day. And it's just really difficult to do that when you have classes divided in half, which we could only bring in half of students, you know, at any given time when we had the six-foot distancing. Yeah. So, because some of the ideas that I had last year, I see you all are implementing them mm -hmm. now. So I'm trying to figure out like who's doing what. So the one that I had uh, talked to Dr. Kisner about, if he's listening, is, and I don't know what you call it when you're actually seeing the owl in the class. The concurrent the model, the concurrent right. Modeling. So some people are doing that and some people are not. 
So we, do we have a standard, like who's doing what, when? Well, some teachers may not need to do that at any given moment because all of their students may be back face to face, and so they may not have to, to teach in a concurrent way. However, we want all of our teachers to be versed in it to a certain extent because if we do have to quarantine, then we would want those students to still join us for instruction. And that is a, you know, it's not, it's not the best solution, but it is a better solution than them not being able to be in school. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't, I'm just asking the questions because these are questions that probably parents are, are sure. thinking of. And sometimes I know the answer and I don't, so I'm just asking these questions. But one of the things I was also thinking about is that I read here something about transportation. So let's pretend transportation is not the problem. Once we get into the school, it is the six feet, three feet kind of thing. We don't know what we have going on. But there are a lot of buildings up and down Highway and 610 and Route 1 that the, the employees are uh, at home. And I was just wondering, I know last year I talked about churches, I talked about buildings. Have we looked at that and see if there are any buildings on 610. I know there's a KPG, there's a couple of buildings that they wouldn't mind, even on Route 1, that has classrooms that they won't mind, you know, but then again, it's the bus thing. And that's why I was asking the question, is it hours or is it days? Because, you know, I got nicked for saying, hey, we have an extra Saturday day, don't send me any emails, um, that we could possibly use to, you know, so I'm just giving these things just to just to start thinking, and I know we're still in piloting and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so that was that was what I was thinking uh, a little bit because of the ventilation and our old buildings. You know, some of the buildings, you know, we could crank up as many as possible. But when we start squeezing three instead of six, then, you know, here, here we come with that issue again. So it's summer, so we could be outside. So that's a good thing. And uh, I think I had one more. Oh, the Internet Cafe. Initially, when I brought it up, it was really for, uh, and it's, it's sprawled into something different now, but it was really for some of those students that actually are at home and but somehow didn't get, you know, the Internet is not working, and so they're coming in. So I'm reading here that it says that they are transitioning into four days. So we're still going to have the, the Internet Cafe for those individuals that, are just needing access. We're hoping we don't have to have internet cafes. So okay. the hope is those students will then come into the classroom. Thank you. And so one of the things that Mr. Anderson and Mr. Fulmer have been orchestrating for us is they're purchasing pods with some of the CARES Act. Well, I suppose it's from that funding, but that allows us to move some furniture out temporarily so that that isn't an issue, that we can provide the proper distancing that we need. So we haven't had to resort to that yet. It, mm -hmm. It's, you know, we're, it's a challenge for some schools, you know, depending yeah. on the population, but we're making it work right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course, we'll, we'll know more in the, the coming days, but I feel pretty confident that we are going to be able to figure that piece out without having an internet cafe. That would be the goal because, you know, the main goal is for yeah. a child to be with his or her teacher. So uh, along those same lines, the goal would also be that eventually all our kids are going to be back in school. Absolutely. Post-COVID, just like the flu, that is still going to be here. We may have to have a booster and I'm not CDC, but I'm just saying I'm thinking long term that at some point in time, we need to start thinking about moving everyone back in, and we need to have that plan how that's going to look, not just the four day, absolutely but the full day with the kids. And that's why I was thinking about other buildings that we could use. So I'm done. Yeah. And Dr. Kisner has made it very clear that he expects five days a week next year. So we're moving. This will really help us to build that bridge to get the experience of looking more like a normal school year. Okay, thank you. All right, Dr. Warner, oh, jump over. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to see the kids getting back in school, but I'm a little concerned about one problem that I've, I've heard at both 
the Head Start and high school and elementary school is parents changing their mind and the logistics of getting kids into the transportation system and into the school. You know, and a lot of times they're doing this without giving it much time. Like they're making these decisions. And I just want, I don't know if, if you are trying to encourage parents to commit and not do these because these upheavals are very difficult to, to, to plan for. So I'm just wondering if, if that's part of your planning and part of your communication with parents is that if they commit to sending their kids to school, please send them to school. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and I think that's one of the things that our principals plan to talk to parents about when they have the uh, town halls. We do want to get back to a more consistent expectation for students to come to school. So that will be important. It's important for the students to have that consistency as well. So that being said, we know there may be circumstances. For example, we may have to quarantine. So we are certainly asking that parents commit to getting back to as close to a normal schedule as we can because we know that's important for their child. And I think that our parents are ready to do that in all honesty. But there may be certain unique situations that just are still a lingering COVID issue that we don't want to say, well, okay, then sorry, just don't come. <laughs> you know, so we, we really are trying to work with each individual family and yet hold that expectation that attendance at school is important. And we have data that shows us that our students need to be in school, and generally they do better when they're in school. So some of our principals are sharing that data with parents as well. Ms. Randall, I believe you were next. Thank you, Ms. Neely. Um, I, I've spoke to you a little bit about this before, but I just kind of wanted to say is um, the specials that you have on their schedule, um, will those be push-ins? Will they be pull-out? And will any of it be done still virtually? So some of it may be done, for example, on that Monday during the asynchronous time. That would be an example of, of virtual, a possibility for some virtual specials. Um, and every school has been given the authority to figure out what works for them. And we've talked about, for example, Fairy Farm that doesn't have access to art or music yet. May have, it may look different there or at Park Ridge where mm -hmm. they're at capacity and they're, you know, they don't have an art or a music room right now. So they're going to have to make a different allowance than other schools will. So we've really allowed that piece um, to the schools. We'll be following all the safety precautions, um, you know, whether they're going, students are going to or whether a, an exploratory is coming to see them. And there may have to be a combination of both. And the other thing that I was wondering is, um, I see that you have lunch and a movement break, and I'm still assuming playgrounds are off limits, but are, um, are there, is there going to be the flexibility of taking the kids out? Because I noticed in some of the schools when I asked, there was still, and, and this was the uppers, not the lowers, but in the schools that I visited, that it was very difficult for them to do an outside because of the keeping the kids where they can be contact traced and I know it's different in elementary because you're with the same teacher all the time and then the middle and high. But I'm just wondering, is there also going to be that flexibility for them to do movement and lunch outside? Absolutely. And we're, you know, we had a conversation today about the possibility of music being outside, you know, if possible and it's appropriate, you know. So there are lots of possibilities. Of course, PE is a natural one. Um, you know, we know that it's important for our students to move. I will add one of the conversations we had today was, you know, typically lunchtime is a time for socialization when I'm talking and eating lunch. But one of the things we've talked about is that may look a little different. And, and of course, principals would address this with parents at the town hall. But what we may want to do is encourage students to just go ahead and eat at lunch, mask up, and then you go get your movement time. And that way, um, you know, we have as least amount of time, you know, it, it may not, and we're not talking and shouting and, and doing all that. So they're really thinking, one thing I think you all know about elementary principals and teachers, we are planners. 
we plain, we have to be. Anyone who has a kindergarten cloud, class full of kindergartners or preschoolers or fourth or fifth graders for that matter, you have to plan every little detail. So I have to say I'm really proud of our team for doing that both with back at their own school sites and as a principal team. We meet two times a week at least for probably at least two hours. And we are planning, planning and sharing ideas. So I give all the credit to them, but, but we're gonna be good. We're gonna figure it out. Ms. Healy. I've gotten some questions from the community about why we're not going back to five days a week in April. And, and I've explained that the plan is for the next school year that, you know, that that's where we're going to aim for. But could you just give a little explanation so that people um, know what goes on on Monday? Because I think there's a, uh, a perception that is strictly a planning day. But I, I know it's a lot more than that, but it's, it's hard for me to explain it. So if you could explain it for our benefit as well as the, um, you know, the, the communities that maybe Sure, Thank sure. You. And, and so Monday is partially a planning day. And, and one of the things I just want to note about that is the planning that we're doing now is so different than anything we've ever planned for before. I'll give you an example of a concurrent class, possibly of kindergartners, where you have you know maybe 10 in the classroom and six on a screen at home. And you're trying to meet the individual needs both you know, both in-house and um, those who are learning virtually, or if you're teaching a specific skill virtually to a, an entire class uh, virtually. All of these nuances are very different than the way that we typically plan. Um, you know, we could put, you know, if you think of kind of a worst model, I'll use that phrase of teaching where you kind of have a sage on the stage and someone just reads and you know, gives information, that's not really helping students learn. We know that. And so we want to make sure that Stafford is known for being a really great school system. We want to continue being a really great school system. And that requires our students to be engaged. And that requires a different level of planning when you have to turn on a dime right now between the what's in front of you, the student in front of you, and the students who also are just as deserving who might be learning remotely. So it does involve a different kind of planning. I think it's something we're gonna learn from and we will definitely take with us um, because we know that our instruction is stronger when we work in our professional learning communities and share with each other. But I, that would be the rationale that I would share and I would welcome any of those folks who ask you, Ms. Healy, to contact me and I'd be happy to talk more specifically with them about it. Um, I think sometimes that's the, the best way for me to address it is just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with parents. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Healy, if I just add, we also have to think about how we clean our facilities, an opportunity to do that. So that's something very new this year in terms of how often we have to clean the frequency of cleaning surfaces, et cetera. So that Monday also gives us an opportunity with fewer fewer people in the building to ensure that our facilities are clean. And we do have small groups on Monday as well for certain students, you know, too. So um, there's that happening alongside. Okay, but, but if we, we can just confirm for the, the benefit of the community, the plan is five days a week. And it's how many hours a day or have you gotten that far in the planning for, for the school year that starts in August? We haven't gotten that far, and um, so I, I'm just going to have to say we'll have to come back on, on that piece. But five days a week has definitely been the expectation. Thank you. All right. Oh, excuse me. Any other questions? I have a couple just follow-up um, pieces. As we move forward with our fourth quarter um, students, and unfortunately this is probably targeted to Mr. Anderson and maybe even Mr. Fulmer, I'd like to eventually have the board receive a report on what are our numbers as we approach the fourth quarter, partly in terms of have students returned, have, um, have some students who maybe we have been asked a question 
or a question, these questions in numerous ways um, about our students and are they going to come back. It is my belief that most, if not all, will be returning to us. And I believe as we move potentially into our fourth quarter. So at some point, I think that would be a, a useful um, piece of information. I know maybe it, it may not be exactly your area, but for us to know, are we getting the calls of saying, I want my student back in school. I took them out this year, just so we have some idea because as we move into that planning for the fall, we also need to have a very good idea of numbers. Many of you know that is, this is of grave concern to all of us, I believe, plus students who may um, stay on grade level or will return or were stayed at home. I just think the more we can get ahead of that as we move into to that piece. So that's sort of a piece of data, certainly forward looking, but that I would like to get um, from staff so that the school board can look at that information. Uh, also with regard, I have, and this is also just a, again, forward thinking, what additional costs may um, come from um, our planning? We need to meet the needs and if it requires additional um, space, if we need to store things outside, if we need additional classroom space, and I'm not gonna say the word, um, learning cottages or whatever we would have to do. <laughs> to, the extent, to the extent that we can start looking at that, which also draws from the first piece, so that we may begin to be looking at those questions as early as possible. Um, so I'm sorry, I know Mr. Fulmer, this probably falls also in your lap as well, but those will be things that for me as we approach that, you know, May timeframe, I wanna get everybody thinking. I believe those are gonna be data points that the board will want to see and consider as we plan for um, next year's budget as well. Oh, Mr. Havis, I'll, I'll just let you know, Dr. Kizzer has already said the expectation that we come back to the board in May. Yeah. To, to start helping you understand what the plan is for the fall. And I think though those numbers as we look at them will be at least data points that um, will be interesting for our community and as well for our funding body as we move forward. So, sure. I thank Ms. Mrs. Neely for a presentation, letting our youngest students as they uh, transition back. Thank you. Thank you, and, I, and thank you all for your support. I know you probably don't hear that often enough, but we really appreciate the support we've been given. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Greider, I believe you are up next. <laughs> Good evening again. Um, Dr. Nichols and I are gonna talk about our slides. Maybe. Those students will become middle schoolers. They I'm will. looking at them. They will, they will be there. And it's a wonderful slide, right? <laughs> That's right. All right. So Dr. Nichols and I are very excited to talk about the return of uh, students four days a week for fourth quarter. We're very excited about that. And the part of my presentation is really just to kind of give an overview of how some of the health agencies have supported that work. So what has changed since the fall? Obviously, uh, new Virginia Department of Health guidelines indicating that Six feet is preferable, but to a minimum of three feet is necessary to, if it's necessary, to get students into school. And our goal, of course, is to get students into school. The American Academy of Pediatrics, and, and Ms. Neely referenced uh, this work at the last board meeting, uh, talks also about keeping desks three feet apart, and ideally six feet apart if you can, but if not necessary, or it is, if, if possible, but, the key is to get all students into school. And wearing masks is a key point. So masking will continue to be a primary mitigation strategy for us. And in fact, none of the mitigation strategies are going away. The only change really is gonna be allowing three feet between students. And then of course, as you all heard on Friday, the CDC came out with its new guidance. Uh, so communities with low, moderate, or substantial, which is Stafford County, um, could go to a minimum of three feet. So in our planning with our principals and with our staff, we've been talking about what three feet would look like. Interestingly enough, the CDC also came out with some guidance regarding what happens when students are eating and also with regard to 
playing instruments, and singing. And so as you see there, maintaining six feet of distance when eating and also uh, in a band and chorus. So that was always a part of our, our planning and preparation. So that's, that's something that we've got covered. So the bottom line is, is that we need students to be physically present in school. And so just if I could read this quote, we encourage schools to develop mitigation strategies that allow students back in the classroom as many of the problems caused by the lack of socialization, learning difficulties with virtual learning, and equity issues can be addressed by getting children back in school. And so we know that that's the important piece of what we need to do. Just one other chart, and I know this is difficult to see, but this is actually a study conducted by the Mayo Clinic, and it was actually published in November. But it, it's a study uh, looking at particle transmission, and it gives a comparison of folks who wear a mask. Uh, one person does and the other person doesn't. Neither person does. And then when both people wear masks. At the very bottom of the chart, it's hard to see, but they looked at if two people are wearing masks, that the distance, whether it's one foot, three feet, or six feet, didn't matter. The key is that students need to wear masks. And as I mentioned before, and, and uh, Dr. Nichols will reiterate, the rest of our mitigation strategies will remain in place. So I'll turn it over at this time to Dr. Nichols. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Jones. As Dr. Grider stated, mask, masking is critical. If nothing else we've learned, wearing a mask is the most beneficial piece to keeping our kids safe and our staff safe. But we're going to continue with the five mitigation strategies that we implemented back in the fall. We're going to continue, as I just said, wearing a mask. We're going to continue to clean surfaces. Our kids are coming into their classrooms. They're sanitizing their hands. They're grabbing paper towels because the teacher, or in some schools I've watched, the stu a student went around, sprayed the desk. It sits, they wipe it off. They have class at the end of the class. They're cleaning the desk again, sanitizing hands and moving on to the next class. So cleaning is a very important aspect of this. Washing hands, hand sanitizing, the social distancing. Again, as Dr. Grider said, that'll be the piece that we're looking at changing a little bit where we're gonna now, instead of keeping it six, we can in some cases where we have to, to get kids back in school, we can go to three feet. But we're gonna maintain social distancing in the hallways, moving around. And again, the last chart over there is our contact tracing. We have our kids in seating charts. We know where they're at so we can contact trace if a breakout would occur, so we can know who's been around who. You know, our target date is that we'd like to target April 20th. Again, it's the fourth quarter, so it's the last nine weeks of school, or eight and a half, actually. So we're going to target April 20th, which is a Tuesday. We'd like to bring back all of our A students and our B students together Tuesday through Friday. And again, as you look at bringing our kids back right now, we have about 50% of the kids in our middle schools are back in each school, it's about 50% of the enrollments. In the high schools, we have about a little less than that, about 46% of our kids are back in our high schools. Returning greater flexibility in space. So in order to combine these classes, in some instances, we're gonna have to decrease the amount of space between desks. But in the majority of our classrooms, you're gonna find at the middle school and high school, they're gonna maintain close to to six at the high school and five to six at the middle school. And I can tell you off the top of my head, it's about 64 classrooms that may be less than six feet in the high school in all five of them. So it's not a lot of classrooms and very few, I think there was one that might have to be at a three in a, in a high school. And that's gonna be a, a bigger class. So again, part of this whole strategy is the adjustments the social distancing. We're going to have to increase our lunch shifts. Currently, we have two lunch shifts. We're going to go to three. In the middle schools where they've had one, they're going to two and even three, um, where we'll be able to provide six feet of social distancing for our students. And again, 
depending where they have their eating, they're eating in the cafeteria, they're eating in the gymnasium and the bleachers, or in the classroom at the different schools. But again, they're maintaining six feet social distancing while they're eating, they remove their mask, they eat, and they mask back up when they're finished. And then as Dr. Greider stated, again, band and chorus, again, they now say we can go to six feet versus the 10, they'll so stay masked up. Again, our chorus teachers with uh, Mrs. Bellino, Anna Marie Bellino, working with our chorus and, and band directors. And again, they're planning to go outside on beautiful days where they can get a 10 foot, unmask a little bit, and do some singing outside where they're outside in the clean air. We no longer have to stay in the classroom for 30 minutes, move out for the air to circulate. They've changed that, that where it's no longer a requirement so they can stay within the band room or the chorus room for the whole 60 minutes of class. And that was approved, again, through the Rappahannock uh, Health Department that Dr. Kisner and uh, Paulette and uh, Dr. Hummer meet with each and every day. And again, I want to thank you. And again, I know Mrs. Neely thanked you, but thank you for your continued support. It's really been a positive experience as far as phasing in. It seems like we're moving right with all the changes and we've been phasing and learning an awful lot as we've gone through this year. From bringing back our most vulnerable in the fall to where in February we're able to bring back our, our students. And again, we phased them in, brought ninth graders, six through eight came in. And then a the week later, we brought our 10th through 12th graders back in. So it's been a good learning experience. I also want to praise our students and our staff and our administrators. They are making this work. Without their, their, their continued efforts to maintain the mitigation strategies, we would not be having the success. Um, and again, a lot of what they've been doing now is we've been bringing in our most vulnerable kids four days a week. You talked about Internet Cafe earlier. We, pretty, with the exception of Mondays, Tuesday through Friday, we've dissolved our Internet Cafes because we're putting kids in classes. So they're able to be in the classroom. And so other areas, uh, CTE classes, they've been continuing to bring them in four days a week so they can get their hands-on applications and complete their uh, competencies. But again, it is due to our students because our students and staff and administrators, you know, they've established a culture of where we wear masks, we wash hands, we walk on the left or the right side of the hallway. Transitions can be a concern, but kids are moving swiftly from point A to point B. And they're getting to the next class, they're hand washing, cleaning the desks, and getting down to business. So it's been very successful in what we've been doing. And looking at our numbers, we feel that we can combine both the A and the B group students and provide four days of instruction for all of our students in a successful environment as long as we continue to maintain and focus on our mitigation strategies. This time, Dr. Greider or I would be happy um, to entertain your question. All right. Sure. Thanks. Ms. Starters us off. Um, will there be more time between classes to do hand washing? And it used we, to be like five minutes between classes, and we're going to add a few extra minutes for kids who want well, to go in and. Actually, uh, what we've done is we added uh, time. We have about 62 minutes, and it came from a teacher's suggestion. Hey, can we add two extra minutes to each class to provide a little more time for the washing of desks and things? And what they've found is that the kids are they're leaving point A and getting to point B in less than five minutes. And even the classes that are further apart, it has not been an issue for kids to get to class. So at this time, we're not looking at changing time. But again, if we have to adjust based on uh, some different numbers, they'll be open to do that. Okay, who's, who's actually washing the desk? Is it the student or is it the teacher? The teacher takes the oxygen and they spray the surface. It has to sit for one minute. The, te the student who's sitting in that desk wipes their desktop down in their chair. And the reason we've done that is we've learned from some other schools that we're going back in the fall that students take ownership of their space. So our kids, when they get into class, they're taking care of their own desk. And at the end of the class, they're cleaning again. So I guess my, my issue with that is, is what, what is the solution that's being squirted onto the desk to clean them? 
Is, is it just an antibacterial? No, it's oxidation. I'm sorry? Did I say that correctly? Oxivir. Yeah, oxivir. Oxivir, it's a solution of hydroxide and another solution that sits on the desk. It sprays and it will evaporate. If they don't wipe it down, it evaporates. And it, honestly, they said if they don't wipe it down, it's not going to cause any issues. It might okay. cause I a guess film I, on the desk. I guess my concern is, is, A, what is it? And if it was my kid and I didn't know what it was, I would want them to go into the bathroom and wash their hands after they handled whatever this solution is. So, so if we have all these kids going into the bathroom, it's, 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 it's probably best to have John Anderson. It's, it's a solution that, that is recommended, so I'll have John Anderson. If it's okay with the board, respond to that question. Yes, um, we had a lot of discussion about the um, disinfectant that's been used. It's on a um, list of items that have been um, suggested by the EPA and um, also has had a lot of scrutiny with Colette and others. So it's a, a really good product, and um, um, that's what we've been using in all of the schools. It's called Oxiver, and um, it's a disinfectant. Okay, and Colette doesn't have any issue with the kids wiping the desk down and going to the next class and having the residue. Okay. Ms. Hollerback, I believe um, Colette is on, or, yep, so. That's not yet. Hi. Go, <laughs> would you like to go ahead and respond? So Oxivir is a peroxide-based disinfectant. It um, breaks down into water as it dissolves on the desk. So the um, it does leave a slight film, but it is water-based. It will degrade into water. Um, the uh, maintenance people very much scrutinized what it was because of the concern for having chemicals in the classroom with the students. And so they really researched it very well. Um, it is able to um, go through the peanut oils and residues to prevent allergy transmission. Um, but it is... It, it's been used on the buses since the beginning of us bringing the kids back into the school system. And again, it's, it's a peroxide based solution and it doesn't have, it's got a very low EVOCs. There's no real smell to it, which is important for our kids with, um, you know, asthma related allergies and things like that. Um, but that is the solution that we're using and it is EPA recommended for, um, use for, uh, coronaviruses. Right. And, and the other viruses that affect school children, like um, enterobacteria viruses and things like that as well. Got it. Thank you so much for being available to answer that for me. Um, no problem. <laughs> the last question I have is, um, high school students that can drive, um, will we give them a break on um, parking fees so that we can get the more kids that can actually drive who maybe wouldn't otherwise be able to afford the parking fees can do that? to eliminate some of the um, kids on the bus? We have not been charging for parking. We've only been issuing parking permits without a fee. Okay. And we did that based on hardships this year with a lot of our fees. I thought I remembered paying for parking fees last year, but maybe I was paying for something else. <laughs> okay, I'm good, thank you. Cool. Dr. Warner, go ahead. Could you just give me an idea what hours the middle school and the high school students will be attending, and will they be getting more, more time in the classroom? So the hours are not changing for middle school, will still be 11 to four. And the high school will remain the same at this time also from 9.50 until three. It'll be five hours a day. All right, Dr. Chase, I'll, I'll bump around. Yeah, so, um, I'm not 100% up on this, but um, so you say middle schools are approximately going to be 50%, high schools approximately 46%. So if a parent has opted for virtual and now they're like, oh, I can get four days a week, will they be allowed to change or will they not be allowed to change? The high school principals in our conversations, that's going to be on a case by case depending on the size of the room right now and how many students are in the class. Okay. Um, but they are open to working on a case-by-case -case basis of that. But right now, they've had very few requesting throughout the, this last month, of course. Okay. I mean, I'm just concerned that will you still be able to maintain the physical distance if suddenly we're increasing the number of kids who want to come 
four, five, four days a week. So I just, I, I, you know, what I had seen from the CDC was the recommendation that you could be three feet for elementary school students. And I hadn't seen quite so much about middle and high school. So I just want to make sure that, you know, we have 17 and 18 year olds who are more like adults than they are like elementary school students. So if I could just answer for the middle school piece. Sure. So. Okay, sorry. So it's, the chart was 50%, but as you know from seeing the statistics previously, there are four schools that are above 50% and four schools that are below 50%, which means that some of the schools where they're above 50%, it's going to be a little bit tighter. So we're not quite like the high schools. We, we will have some classes that may have some students that are three feet apart, um, but the majority will be from five to six feet for, for most of the middle school. Right. Um, yeah. So. But if you got even higher than, you know, if you, if you had a lot more kids coming back, you sure. might have trouble maintaining three feet. So, so I just want to make sure we're not going to uh, potentially find ourselves in that situation. And so that's a, that's a really good point. And I would say to you that we have had middle school principals who have been dealing with that issue currently, that they've had kids that were, that initially wanted virtual and now are calling and saying that they want to come back hybrid. And because they don't know exactly what kids are going to show up in the fourth quarter, they're not necessarily able uh, to, to give those spaces away right. because obviously they, want, they do want to uh, maintain the appropriate distance. But as Dr. Nichols says, it is on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. And so if we feel like that we can accommodate those students and not cause a problem for us in fourth quarter, then we're going to do that. Right. And then I, I just note that it's revised CDC guidelines in middle schools and high school students should be at least three feet apart in areas of low, moderate, or substantial community transmission. Um, I just, I'm not quite sure what number we're using. I know that Stafford is still on some lists as very high. So we're at current positivity is 6%. Um, and so I just didn't know how we right. were, were handling that. And, you know, I'm a little concerned with spring break and seeing some of the crazy stuff that's going on that then might make its way back to Stafford. I just want to make sure that, that we are right. doing our due diligence. I, I would love to have kids in four days a week. I just want to make sure they're in safely. So, so I did go to the CDC website to check and see where Stafford was rated and Stafford is rated as a substantial and not a high risk area. All right, Ms. Randall, go ahead. I am so glad to hear about the distancing for the band and chorus because watching the band at uh, Drew and I, even my nephew um, in Minnesota having to practice and then after 30 minutes they have a timer that goes off and they had to pick up all of their instruments and move to the classroom next door and continue their practice. So it's just nice to see that um, the, and the work that they're doing in, the, in these classrooms is really, really awesome. So I'm glad to see that that went away or is made easier for them. Um, and I think Colette mentioned something about this, but I know that in some of the middle schools, and, and, I know, and I'm glad that you guys give so much flexibility to the administrators to know their staff and know their students and how to do things. And some are using the cafeterias in the high school and some are using classrooms in the high school. And that was a concern that I had. And I think she said that, but um, about like if you're eating in there and there's a peanut allergy or whatever allergy, that there is a way to not risk anyone's health in the room with these cleaning products. Right. So the Oxivir solution is equally effective with the coronavirus as it is with the allergies. Okay. So when that's sprayed on the desk, it takes care of not only the coronavirus, but also uh, the, the issues that you'd have with allergies. So yes, ma'am. Okay. And I've seen the spring and how that's run in the schools and a couple of them, and uh, they do a really good, students do a really good job moving, cleaning. I've seen it. It's, it's very, very nice. Um, and can you go over who is piloting for the middle school and the high schools? We, uh, we are not having a pilot. Not we piloting? are all starting on the 20th. Everybody. Everybody. Okay. And that's, oh, and are we keeping an internet cafe for subs? It, uh, like if a classroom doesn't have a sub, but they need to be monitored, are they, are they using it for that? Or are they just going to push in monitors or? Because I know sometimes that sub situation gets a little tricky. Yes, we've been using other locations within our buildings when they need a sub. 
or if their teacher's not available and they need to go into, like, like you said, an internet cafe type, we're just moving into different classrooms. And we still have those spaces that we've been using as internet cafes. We're just not populating them. Ms. Young. Um, so I think uh, the last time when you all were here, I beat the question about the solution to death. And so it came up again today. But um, I have another question on top of that because uh, I'm going to bring it up again because I just want to make sure that you know, parents know, there are going to be some kids that are going to say, I'm not cleaning anybody's stuff. So I guess somebody's going to be ready to spray that desk. That's one. Two, um, that spray bottle, everybody's touching that same spray bottle. The teacher is the one that's spraying. Okay, so the teacher will spray if the child decided, the student decided, I'm not Okay, so all they're doing is wiping. Gotcha. And then um, for the students to know that it's no horsing around. You had mentioned it the last time we talked about that, that if they decide that they're going to play, take off mask, you know, peekaboo, that's, that, that's not going to work here, right? For the last month, we've had students in on both A and B day, and they've been following these procedures. And we have not had a report where a student said, no, I'm not cleaning right. or wiping my desk down yet. In the right. past, I think the biggest thing is my, you know, the nose, but they address right. it just as Dr. Kisner said. And if they don't follow through, we have right. another option for them. Right, because there's going to be more individuals wanting to come to school, but they just need to know that this is mask up. And, and the political atmosphere, you know, it's different. But when you walk through Stafford County schools, this is our rule, right? As we said, it's critical to wear a mask. That's, masking is critical. And Ms. Jones, let me just add that, uh, and I know they, that they, they've implied this, but our students have been very compliant. Um, and I, you know, I believe students rise up to or down to expectations. If we set the expectations, students will meet them. All right, any other questions? Don't run yet. A um, couple things, I know that um, Ms. Neely mentioned about town halls being done. I, is there, what is the communication plan at the secondary level? Our principals will be hosting town halls within the next three weeks with their communities to get the information out. So they can sit down and, and provide the information that we've gone over tonight and actually go into a little more detail. We, we've, not, we've not discussed it at this point in time, but we do expect to be doing the same. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chase, do you have a follow-on? Yeah, I just had a, a one thing I just wanted to mention. Um, I, I heard today that the King George football team was all quarantined. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we are aware that, that these things could happen. And so, yes, your child can come in for four days a week, but if suddenly that classroom has some kind of an exposure. We have a quarantine policy, and so it is possible that children in all, all 13 grade levels could, could end up being quarantined, even though they're well, but if there's been an exposure or something. Am, am I correct about that? And again, we're contact tracing at six feet, so we could have some quarantines in that case, yes. Um, I'm gonna bring up one, and this is not to put you on the spot to answer this question tonight. I'm sure you know where I'm going because I had a senior last year. I know there will be a lot of questions about um, graduation. I know that your team, they love these students. They want to make sure that we um, do graduation in the best way possible for our students. I do know that probably, I know we've just gotten back from spring break, so I am very much conscious of that. However, I also need to say from a planning perspective of a parent, um, you know, whether it comes down to tickets, I just hope that um, as we examine this, and I know your principals know this, we do have blended families. The traditional two or three tickets may or may not be su sufficient for some of our students for in-person. I know that there are many things that you all have to be looking at, um, but I do think we do need to be working on those plans. I know concurrently with all of this, but being the parent of a student who had a wonderful graduation last year. Mountain View did a great job. However, this opportunity is here, but I, 
you know, I know you all are working on it, but as soon as we can begin to get those plans out to just for planning purposes, this is not to put you on the spot, but it's on everybody's no. mind. <laughs> I have to tell you, last Wednesday during spring break, when everybody's on vacation, when the governor made those announcements, we were already talking last week. So we have ideas that we feel based on the 30% capacity in our stadiums. And I think the thing we're getting back is that, you know, people taught different venues for more people. And like, you know, our seniors deserve to be in their school. They haven't been in there all year. So they're really looking forward, whether it's a two days of four ceremonies or four days of four ceremonies, um, we're looking at ways in which parents or students can have a great deal of tickets. And, and we're not talking five or six. We're looking at a little more than that, to where they can actually bring family and, and have that joyous occasion. Again, our, our class sizes are anywhere from 400 to 460, I think is the span for our senior classes. So we feel we'll be able to provide an experience that will allow students to bring family members to help celebrate. And we're planning, I believe it's the last meeting in April to actually come forth with a plan. I appreciate that. I just know that is on the minds of the senior parents. So um, I'd like to thank you all for uh, addressing this and, and bringing forward what we want to do with the best interest of our students. I guess one of the things we would say to parents who are watching tonight, if you are considering a change to your current selection, earlier the better of contacting your guidance counselor or school would that be what what advice or what is there anything you would like to say in terms of that will help facilitate this process on the 20th so, I actually offer that to all three of you <laughs> so I, I would agree with what you just said um, however parents need to keep in mind that um, we do have to look at the distancing piece and so those parents that selected the virtual option, they have to understand that. And honestly, we, we have had students that said they were going to come in hybrid and did not. And so we need to see what the actual count of students is at, at, on the 20th and that week before we can make some decisions. But obviously, yes, parents should notify us, especially if they want their kids to come in, as Dr. Nichols said, a case-by-case -case basis. And I would also like to say thank you for all of your support, because I feel like this whole process that we've gone through, I feel like that, that in Stafford County, we've done it really well. And so I, I wanna thank you all, because I think you've done a great job. I think Ms. Young had a follow-up based on. Real, real quick, I know that we talked about transportation throughout the process. What I didn't hear is like, what do you need from us? Or I know you, you've heard from parents, but what is that gap? Like, what is the, how are we how are we carving out the problem to fix it like what is is it we don't have enough buses or is it the time or is it the day like is it like what what are we struggling with i would probably uh, have to defer to chris or barry on that but i do know that mr suddeth has done everything he can to make sure we get every student to school and he's anytime we call and we said hey we're looking at coming back four days he goes We'll make it happen. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't have approved that consent item that had his retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> we may rescind that. Um, but I think if there are things that we really would like to say to parents of things to keep in mind or something like that, let's communicate that. I believe um, Dr. Kisner with Dr. Jones will be... Um, sending out those letters, but my impression is most parents want to be part of the solution. I think we have asked um, in the transportation area, so I think that message has gotten out, but now is there a, that second piece, telling us early, those kinds of things, maybe just making sure we hit those things in a um, any communication with our parents. So giving you the idea to think about that and certainly to talk to Dr. Jones and also to Dr. Kisner on how do we help parents be the best partner that they can be with us in this process to begin on April 20th. So, all right, thank you everybody for your, your assistance. Um, so for board members, we have citizen comments as next. We have um, no citizen commenters here this evening, so I will just 
move on from that particular item. We will move on to our board committee reports. Our first committee report is our student discipline committee report. Ms. Randall, would you read that for us, please? On March 4th, 2021, a committee of the school board met to consider one student disciplinary matter. The committee lifted the expulsion for student A and permitted the student to return to the regular school program. Okay, thank you. Are there any standing committee reports from any board members? All right, hearing none, I am gonna, um, and I try very rarely to do this, uh, invoke sort of a uh, chairman's privilege to just bring us up to date on the budget so that those who are watching our meeting have some idea what is going on. The school board did present in a seven on seven meeting, which was referenced at our last meeting. It was, um, we will also be um, engaging. Dr. Warner gave a wonderful overview. I was going to ask that the school division clip Dr. Warner's uh, presentation on behalf of the school board so that we may be able to have that available in, in a prominent place on our website, as well as perhaps sharing it on our social media that there's a link so that that can be watched by interested students. I mean, interested students and families, of course. The uh, Board of Supervisors met during spring break uh, regarding the setting of the tax rate. How that is done is a tax rate is set that is can be no higher than. So that has been done. The Board of Supervisors has been meeting in budget work sessions. There is an additional work session on March 25th at 2 p.m. as well as on March 30th that can be live streamed for anybody, not just board members that can be watched. Um, the other piece, as we always remember, of the budget that goes on is not just the budget, there is also our CIP that is being di discussed and the school board has been asked some questions regarding high school six and whether um, it is appropriate and it has asked the school board to yet again study the University of Mary Washington site. Those, those questions will be uh, shared with the board as well as our responses. There has been a request to additionally study that and the addition and what the costs would be of adding cafeterias, fields, and other items. So I just want to make the board aware there will be a follow-on email to everyone um, just to make you all aware of that fact. So I appreciate that indulgence, but it's best to bring forward those items in our session. So Dr. Jones, and, and of course, a shout out to Dr. Kisner, and we are all, all wishing him the best. Dr. Jones, you, it is your, your, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. There's three quick uh, updates. Um, over the uh, spring break, uh, three uh, Stafford County employees, including Roxanna Bandez Muldoon, Liesl Yeski from Laud, and uh, ESOL coach Jesse Tipling participated in a virtual job fair with the University of Puerto Rico. Um, during, during the spring break, um, our recruiter spoke with 10 candidates about teaching positions, offering information sessions about Sanford County and specific opportunities within the division. This was obviously our first opportunity, our first effort in, uh, in recruitment in Puerto Rico to bring more employees who reflect our student diversity. So I, wanted, I want Patrick asked me to share that particular note with you. Additionally, uh, Stafford County Public Schools received news last week that they were awarded year two funding for the Advancing Computer Science Grant of uh, $118,000. The grant provides funding to support a multi-school division effort to equip students to embed computer science lessons in interdisciplinary ways by creating performance tasks. Uh, these tasks will also be added to the Go, Go Open Virginia repository of open source curriculum and resources with the state. The grant includes Dahlgren, Code Virginia, UMW, and the Virginia Society of T Technology Education supporting partners. So we're really glad to be a second year recipient of that grant. And then um, I'm also pleased to announce uh, that uh, our staff will be working regularly with Leah Walker, who is the Director of Equity at the Virginia Department of Education, to help us develop our equity plan for Stafford County Schools. So we, we will start regular meetings with her in April. And then lastly, it's already been mentioned, but I just want to say uh, on behalf of Dr. Kisner, I really want to thank the board because my observations as someone who's still relatively new is there are a couple things that you've done. You've trusted our staff and you've supported our staff and you've allowed us to have the resources 
to navigate the pandemic. So we're really, as a staff, we're very thankful for your support. And hopefully next Monday, everybody will um, dial in for our band together to fight hunger. That was my one other thing that we wanted to mention. So next on our agenda, we do not at this point have any action items. However, I would draw the board's attention to several of our information items that we may need to uh, reconsider that. Our first information item is the approval of, for the award of a construction task order to train Inc. for the amount of $252,000 to improve the HVAC phase two. I see Mr. Anderson approaching the podium. So I will let Mr. Anderson um, take questions or if you would like to give us an overview, that is fine. It's up to you. Yes, um, thank you, um, Ms. Hazard. Um, I'm John Anderson, uh, Executive Director for Facilities and Maintenance. And um, this action item is for a task order that will be to improve our um, building automation systems. Um, the basic work is um, including repair or replacement of CO2 and humidity sensors. Um, we accomplished a lot of work last year, thanks to our operations and maintenance department and um, contractors and engineers that worked with them. We got a whole lot of work done. Um, these are sort of lower priority issues that were identified that we need to go and have access to and check and then make repairs where needed, sometimes replacement of these sensors. And it's basically in all of the schools except for New Moncure, um, that's the one school that didn't have any issues uh, like this that need to be investigated and repaired. So we decided that we would ask for this to be moved to action. We presented it to the FAB committee on March 1st and they agreed that this should be a high priority um, for funding and to take care of. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Dr. Warner, do you have any comment? Um, I was just going to, Madam Chair, I was going to move, I was going to make a motion to move this item to action. Second. Uh, <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded to move this agenda item to action. Any discussion about that? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Dr. Warner, do you have a follow-on motion? Yes, I would like to make this item 9.01 um, and move to, to action to approve the award of the construction for the HVAC upgrades. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Anderson, get us our sensors. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Our next item, as you get to stay in your in your spot, is um, the approval of the award of multiple construction contracts. Um, Mr. Anderson, I will let you continue. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. And um, these are grouped together. Um, we tried this last year and it was well received. So um, we have seven construction projects that will be ready for action on April for the April 13th meeting. And um, some of these actually the bids open today. Um, there's six projects that have been included on the 3R list that you would see in your CIP report that was approved last September. Um, one project was the result of some issues we discovered um, late last year and um, was brought to the FAB um, and made a priority. And um, I can run through the projects very um, briefly if you like. Um, the North Stafford High School mechanical improvements, um, we continue to work on that school and it's um, being done in a phased approach. I'm happy to report that the chiller replacements have gone very well um, during the, the cool weather season. Um, so the chillers are very important to have working right now. And, um, and that project has been a, a really big success. Um, this is air handling units that are um, also in the building that need to be uh, replaced. And so we've done the design and actually this is one of them that the bids open today and we got some really good bids, um, so we're ready to um, review those and come back to you and request action on April 13th. Um, the next one is the um, A.G. Wright gym floor and bleacher replacements, and I wish um, Mr. Boatwright was here to <laughs> um, hear me um, uh, talk about this project. He has been um, pushing for this. There are actually uh, gaps in the flooring and um, just issues that need to be addressed. Um, we're using three are set aside funds and also some remaining project funds um, to get this project done. And we, we um, 
are within budget, and we'll be coming back with a recommendation for award on this one as well. Um, HH Pool is a two-phase project. Um, it's a bond-funded project, and we're going to be able to do um, the second floor this summer. Um, we're going to be attacking the first floor in summer 2022, and we split it that way so that we're not disrupting the entire school at one time. Um, these are floors, walls, ceiling improvements. They had their mechanical upgrades, and so this is coming back and actually finishing um, some of these components that are now looking very worn um, because of those uh, because of that mechanical work. Mr. Anderson, if you could just take a, a, a breath for just a second. Were there any questions on um, question on item number one or number two? I just thought be I, I was just going to ask about the AG right. Um, so isn't it sooner better than later to get that done because um wouldn't they be needing that area for summer school or for i mean for the little ones like how are uh, we planning been, we've been working with mr boatwright and uh -huh. um, he's agreed that we can um, work on this over the over the summer, summer and okay. it will be involving removing the existing floor and removing the existing bleachers and so there there will be a okay, um, disruption good. for that space okay good to know just one other comment about the number two um, item. I do see that it says that the Board of Supervisors will need to appropriate this money before the award contract. Is there anything that the board members need to do regarding that particular item? Uh, the appropriation will be handled uh, through a letter from Dr. Kisner. Okay. Thank you. You mean Dr. Jones? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the next project is the Colonial Forge Tennis Courts. And um, if you've seen that, it's um, cracked um, pretty much all over the courts. And so we have a structural engineer that's evaluating the soils and we're working through a job order contract. They've given us preliminary pricing. So we should be able to repair that over the summer and um, provide a sufficient base so that this does not happen again. Any questions? All right, seeing none. The um, upgrade PDC HVAC is the project that I mentioned that had, um, that we've discovered some issues last year. Um, it's basically high humidity in that building during the muggy summer months. And so what we are gonna do is add a um, distributed outside air system, dedicated outside air system. And um, that's gonna allow the, the entire system to work much better. Um, we've opened the bids on that, and we're um, working through the logistics for um, for planning the construction project. We'll be coming back um, April 13th with this one as well. The next project is the install kitchen ACs, and um, this was one of my first projects here last year. And we took care of the hottest schools um, that, that had the biggest problems based on temperature readings. Um, those projects were successful last summer. And so these next four are the, um, the next priorities. Um, we have two schools that um, we're still monitoring that we've done some adjustments to that we think we can um, um, work with the existing systems. One of them is Stafford Middle School, and the other one is um, North Stafford High School, which um, we would incorporate the North Stafford High School project into one of these big um, um, HVAC projects anyway. So these four are independent and um, um, we've gotten the bids open on these today, and um, um, all of the bids were within our budget. We're reviewing those now. And then the um, last project is Rodney Thompson Replaced Fire Alarm System. Um, this is also on the 3R list, and we've had um, issues with finding the, part, the parts for repair of these systems. Um, if in the past, we've had to replace these and it's been an emergency purchase. Um, so this has been on the three hour list to get done and um, we're trying to prevent having to address it as an emergency and go ahead and um, replace it now with a new system. And that's it. Um, we'll be coming back April 13th um, asking for um, action on these. And then these are not, not the only projects we're working on. They're the ones that we're really focusing on trying to get done over the summer. So I appreciate you um, hearing about these as information today. So we'll be ready for action. All right, Dr. Warner. Just one quick question. So the Rodney Thompson Middle School, the fire alarm system, that sounds like a, a serious one. Mm -hmm. Will that be able to be completed by the start of the upcoming school year? Yes, that's our intent. Okay. 
All right, hearing no other questions, moving on to our uh, adoption of a resolution to declare the old Moncure Elementary School property as surplus and to convey said parcel to the county of, to Stafford County and to accept the conveyance of the new Moncure Elementary School property. Are there yeah. any, um, I don't know, uh, is this Mr. Fulmer? I, mm -hmm. I see I see a whole group of people. Oh, Fulmer. Mrs. Boat, right? I have a quick question about that. Uh -huh. um, no. Why are we designating it as surplus and then handing it over? It's actually, I'll let, it would probably be better for me to let Ms. Boat right <laughs> answer that question. Good evening. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing that because that was agreed to in 2012 in the, mem in the memorandum of agreement with the county and also under the code, that is the way to properly convey the land or the um, old Moncure property. Oh, okay. So I, I was just wondering if there was some kind of underlying <laughs> ramification of calling it our surplus that they were, you know, it would add you know, a, a million or two dollars to to what we own in, in land. Okay, that's you all. You can either sell it or you have to declare it a surplus in order to convey it. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other any other questions? I'm just curious, why did it take so long? I mean, the supervisors issued their um, basically request last September. We've been out of Moncure for a while, so. So there was a delay on the Board of Supervisors side. They had to work, apparently is what we were told, they had to work with VDOT in order to get some plat issues resolved. And so it did take a while. So the delay was actually not on our side. Well, plat issues, I mean, we signed a deed, according to this, we signed a deed back in, you know, 2012-ish. Um, and I assume we have a legal description of the property we're conveying. So why would a current flat issue? Well, this probably isn't a question for you. No. Uh, but but I but I'm just a little concerned that we had this agreement, and you know the the, the deal was that once we got our occupancy permit for the new Moncure, and of course finished moving out of the old Moncure, we would we would convey the old Moncure declare it surplus and convey it to the county. And of course, then for our benefit, we get the deed to the new Moncure. So, I, you know, it's right. It hasn't so been any harm, but it to me, it just looks like there has been an inordinate amount of time passed from the time the supervisors passed their resolution last September. And here we are in, you know, the late March that is just coming to our board to make this declaration the question so um just a few weeks ago the assistant county attorney sent to our attorney at parish need the draft deed so we didn't have that from them hmm. i'd like to call out yeah i didn't see the deed here is that is the deed in here i, I may have missed it and no the draft is not in there that was no the draft is not in there that was being reviewed and worked on by our outside attorney well this board member would be interested in seeing it. Sure. Maybe that could be sent to us. We can certainly do that. And can we also get a copy of the deed uh, to the county? What well, I can look it up if if, if we can. I, I can. It's pretty I easy. To I have it. Okay. I'd like to compare the two. I'd like to thank Mrs. Boatwright because there did become an issue that. Um, Mrs. Boatwright ended up reading the MOA very well and pointed out some issues that needed to be resolved on the county side prior to bringing it to our board. And that's probably the best that I will say about that matter. Ms. Young. Well, all of us aren't privy probably... to that. So if, if we knew what was going on, maybe we, I wouldn't have these questions. But all I know is you know, we, had, we had an MOU, and, and I was here back when it was negotiated, that was the only way we were going to be able to get the land for the new mine cure is to have this memorandum of understanding. And it just seems that it's taking a while, but apparently there's some factors that Seem our chair is aware of, but have not been shared with all of us. So. We've tried to have this um, agenda item on our agenda for a while, but um, right. issues have come up, which we can discuss um, Offline. Again, we were just waiting to get the draft of the deed from the county. 
So Ms. Young had a question. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm not sure who this question is for, but we we have um, that's been our storage. Do we need any? You need anything from us to get like? Do we have to think about storage somewhere else? Do we have to look for a building? I'll like what's that to the Mr. Bomer. what's going to be the status on that? Good evening. Um, yeah, we're pulling um, pods and some other things at all of our schools. We already have some at our, some of our schools now, because um, obviously Moncure, old Moncure wasn't got, not going to hold all of our uh, storage needs or meet all of our storage needs. So um, we've already acquired and actually have plans and more on the way to assist all the schools as we come back to four days a week. All right. Any further questions or some additional information will be provided to the board prior to the next school board meeting. All right. Our next item is our um, annual plan for special education. I'm looking at the board. Would anybody like to get up and walk around for a few minutes or would you like to keep going? Keep going. Okay. I wasn't sure. I was trying to read body language a little bit. So uh, Dr. Hummer, I believe, will be our presenter on, on, our, um, on our special education plan. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't I, did I misspeak? Sorry. Did I misspeak? I thought I said doctor. Yeah, no, no presentation. Um, just okay. want to be available for any questions. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, School Board, Dr. Jones. Just want to provide you with just a brief overview of the annual plan. This is something that is submitted every year to you all to review. Um, it involves our 611 funds that we receive from the state, and that's for services and supports for our students with disabilities in grades K through 12. And it's also our 619 funds for our students that are in preschool as well as our set aside funds for services for students that are in private schools, as well as in our home school and homeschooling. Um, so this plan is reviewed with our SEAC, which we reviewed two weeks ago. Um, and I also present this information to our private schools and our home schools to see if there's any, any services or supports um, that our students re require. Um, and out of that meeting, we also talked about any sort of additional training that they would need in order to support students with disabilities in their facilities. So I just wanted to see if there was any questions? Again, there's, this is the same plan that's been submitted every year. The only changes is the amount of uh, funding we receive from the state, which increases every year based on our number of our students. All right. Any questions or comments? Just real quick, what, what's the percentage of increase that we've had from this year to last year? I, I know the dollar amount. I don't know the percentage. Right. So last year we received, it looks like $4,700,000. Mil, $4, and this year we received five million fifty-three. I wasn't really trying to get that money uh, out in the open. I was just talking about the kids. Oh, this is public knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> if I see anything, I'll just make a, a call out to our special education advisory committee that our advisory committees do have a role in several of our things, and um, special education advisory committee is required by law, and part of their job is to assist in this. So yes, ma'am. Want to give a shout out to them um, and their work. All right. Our next item is the approval of the per oh. Thank you. Yep. Oh. Is the approval of the purchase of up to 6,000 Chromebooks for elementary, middle, and high school students in an amount not to exceed $1.8 million using FY21 mm -hmm. savings. I see uh, both Mr. Fomer and Mr. Cook are here. So any questions? Dr. Warner? So this um, purchase of 6,000 would be about 20% of what we currently need for our students. Is that for just replacement? It, and is that sufficient for, it, for scheduling our replacement and recycling? Or, you know, and are we allowing uh, enough of an allocation for new and incoming students? So we, um, we have about, uh, we're working on a five year replacement cycle, so 20%. Um, the, um, the numbers that we're looking at have two pieces built in. One is about a 2% annual growth of students and, uh, you know, across the board. And the other part is, uh, we're assuming a percentage of loss of students not returning, uh, potentially, um, of about 5%. Hopefully it won't be that high, but, um, you know, we have, we have to order now. Uh, or as soon as possible so we can get them in in time for the for the new school year. But we have um, probably about 
a little over 5,000 that are end of life in September. Are there any questions? Is it is this a Mr. Fulmer or Mr. Cook? Is this an item that is urgent to get ahead of all the other school districts that are probably also ordering yeah, yes, Chromebooks? It seems like they're probably a yeah, hot yes, commodity, there, but it's just a, a question. It, it would be the sooner the better. Oh, Dr. Well, I just, I so just yeah, want to make just, sure. That, wait, hold on. Let me oh, yeah. go this way and I'll bounce that way. Yeah. Um, I just see that it's not budgeted, so where is the money going to come from to pay for it? And yeah, I mean, I'll, just I'll feel like Chris we've just spent Brown. a lot of money on Chromebooks this year, and so now we need to buy another 6000 Yes, ma'am. We, we had about um, 20000 roughly out for 30,000 students when we went to the, you know, when the pandemic started. So um, we had to buy a lot but we still have the older ones from before. So um, as they age, um, we have to replace them as part of the replacement cycle, of course. But my understanding, this is from uh, proposed or uh, I guess uh, savings from this current year is how we're funding it. Um, but Chris can give you more information on that. Um, uh, and, and Jay's uh, on the right track there. So um, I did when I did the mid-year financial report, I kind of went over the uh, projected expenditure savings. And on the same side, really on our revenue side, we budgeted, um, of, have talked about this several times, so uh, forgive me, but we budgeted $3 million in state revenue um, that we set aside because we run certain what state revenues uh, were going to look like for FY21. Um, we now are certain that not only is the state going to um, meet those $3 million that we set aside, but we're going to have approximately another $2 million on top of that. Um, so our state revenues are going to exceed budgeted revenues, um, including the $3 million set aside by about $5 million. So uh, very comfortable with uh, state revenue outlook after the General Assembly action on the, on the no-loss funding. And so we'll be starting with that $3 million contingency that we set aside that we now are certain that uh, we'll have available to us. And that would be our, our target for any of these uh, first uh, year-end items that we're um, targeting. Let me go to Dr. Warner and then Ms. Young. I think. Yeah, I was just, I, I, I guess my concern is, is are we purchasing enough now? I mean, if, if, if it's 20%, 2% growth, and I know it's a five-year cycle through, I just want to make sure that, especially with, um, there's an increased, obviously, demand on technology and computers and Chromebooks, since almost every school in the country is, is switching to it, I just I just want to make sure that our purchases are are enough to sustain what we need, and to replace you know aging and broken merchandise. So. Yeah, yes, ma'am. This this will get us started for sure. Yes, yeah. Um, I think it's around the same question, but maybe a little bit different. So. Uh, are these for replacements or are these in addition? Because what I'm thinking, kids are coming back. What, what, what is the plan? That was one question. What is the plan for these? And then um, my second question would be, did we, would we not cover this with CARE-X fund? And especially if we're getting more coming in, wouldn't that be covered by that? Yeah, it could potentially be uh, the new source of the federal stimulus money that we're, uh, we, it would qualify for that. Right now, um, we're still waiting on the official numbers that we're getting from the federal government, and we know that a large amount of that is going to have to be dedicated to learning loss and remediation over the next few years. So um, we're not targeting that yet. The, the year-end money uh, and the, the additional revenue that we have from the state now has to be used by June 30th, so we're targeting that to spend that first where the federal stimulus money, uh, there's been several different increments of that. Some of it is good from all the way up to September of 22. And actually, I think the, the newest um, uh, stimulus money is going to be good through September of 23. So uh, we'll be waiting. You know, we, we want to target the funds that will expire at June 30 before we start tapping into the federal stimulus. Yeah, the, these are part of the replacement cycle. We, we would have to. Yes, ma'am. What percentage of those students are coming back in? 
Does it matter? Does it, it, not matter? it will will swap them out in mm -hmm. the fall. They're oh. they're gonna um they're not end of life until September, so they'll have them for the the summer learning adventure, and uh, I'll probably say that. And so it's wrong, probably but, uh, the idea that regardless of what we do, that every child would have a computer, even if they're in school or not. For example, if they're sick and they need to go home, but they're well enough to work at home, they could work at home. That's kind of the plan, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Ma and I appreciate that you added in the 2% growth that we are expecting. Um, yes, ma'am. <laughs> you know, that will be... So I do think that that is something we do need to always be considering. Um, if anybody has driven through the community, we are growing. And there's going to be a lot of students coming that we need to plan for. So you need a motion? Uh, is, if there is the appetite. I'd like to make a motion to move item 10.05, the purchase of 6,000 Chromebooks for our schools, to item to action item 9.02. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any comment re regarding moving this to action? Um, I would just say I'm I'm not personally comfortable moving it to action yet because I'm just processing it. But that's just me. Understood. Uh, Madam Please Chairman, I, I would like to clarify for the record that this is not necessarily using savings from the current year, as I understand from Mr. Fulmer that there is additional funding that is available that was not um, known for sure earlier. Um, the way this is written, it says savings, and, and in that case, I would agree with Dr. Chase to do an expenditure of almost $2 million immediately um, would concern me. But if this is additional funding that's coming in, I think that's different. I mean, I, I understand the need, but you know, when I look at savings, I'm going to want to look at the big picture of all the projects that have been put on hold, projects that have been moved down, um, the, the, the R projects, um, all kinds of things. But I can support moving this forward tonight if indeed that, that is the case. If I could just have Doug, um, Mr. Fulmer confirm I understood that correctly, that this is, you know, one, the source of this would, would be additional state funding, would you uh, say? Yes, ma'am. So the state funding that um, was budgeted for FY21, we took $3 million of that and set it aside because of uncertainty mm -hmm. uh, with the pandemic. And now we know that we will be receiving all of that state funding. Okay. So it's, it's just a little confusing because the way this is written, it says that it's um, from, from savings. And, and it also um, does address the growth as well. So this is not just replacing current um, older Chromebooks. It's adding new ones to the inventory for the new students that we expect next year. That's correct. That, that's what the agenda item says. Yeah, correct. Okay. All right. Well, in that, in that case, I will... I will support moving into action. All right. All those in favor of moving this item to action, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Um, let's see. Ms. Virgo, would you pull the board, please? Dr. Chase? Mm -hmm. No. Ms. Hazard? Yes. Ms. Healy? Yes. Ms. Hollerback? Yes. Ms. Randall? Yes. Dr. Warner? Yes. Ms. Young. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes by a vote of six to one. Thank you. Is there a follow on motion? Motion to move action item 9.02, um, the purchase of the Chromebooks. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Ms. Virgo, will you please pull the board again? Dr. Chase? No. Ms. Hazard? Yes. Ms. Healy? Yes. Dr. Ms. Hollerbeck? Yes. Ms. Randall? Yes. Dr. Warner? Yes. Ms. Young? Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes by a vote of six to one. All right, thank you. Moving on to our final item regarding the approval 
of um, and proposed repeal of several policies. These were brought before the governance committee um, going through different uh, policy updates. Um, Ms. Randall, do you want to take the lead? Sure. So for um, discussion purposes tonight, <clears throat> hopefully to clarify so we can move to vote next week or next time, um, the first three policies are listed. Lisa uh, vetted these through many different, and she'll come up and help with this as well, but she vetted these through many different people and processes and updates, um, as some of them hadn't been updated since 2013. And the first three, um, there are no changes, um, and we can discuss those. And then uh, the next three are um, to be repealed. Um, and the last uh, batch are have some amendments to them that have um, a legal requirement or, um, it, you know, some sort of an update to them. Uh, so we can go through them in batches if there's any discussions. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Leanne. Um, I would like to know, the Governance Committee met on this, right? Um, Ms. Boltwright brought these up to the Governance Committee. What is your recommendation? Our recommendation is to um, accept as they were, as they are written now. We did make some changes based on some concerns. Um, and so the recommendation of the governance committee is to accept these as they are now written. Okay, can you talk about the changes that you made? Because I think that's what y'all met about, right? Like why you're recommending that they, I mean, I started to go through them mm -hmm. and I'm saying, okay, the governance committee met, so I guess you could update them because it sounds like you just said we're going through them. So um, you could update us on what you changed. I don't know. Yeah, so yes, um, mostly what we changed were in the amendments. Um, the first one was the school attendance area. And one of the things that we changed was the, um, I think it was the, well, we had to change the name of the enrollment, but we changed it from um, where it says at the bottom, uh, when less than 5%, we changed it to 10% of the student body that the superintendent has the right to make um, a school attendance adjustment. Um, but we did add that uh, we would prefer that the superintendent notify the board in advance of any adjustments so that if there is an issue, we have the opportunity to discuss it. That's the first one that we yeah, did. I'm good with that first one because I don't even know, I mean, the fact that he's in charge of the school system, he could notify us even, I don't see why he has to notify us before, but I'm, I'm good with him um, doing that. So I'm good with the first one. Ms. Healy, I saw, I saw I you I know waving. the hand was coming. I'm, I'm having a little <laughs> heart, heart failure here. Um, <laughs> Has, has everyone here been a party? I don't know, two of redistricting. I think our latest two members may not have not had that, end. <laughs> that pleasure as, as a board member. Um, changing goals for families is very, very emotional. And that 5% was established to give the superintendent some flexibility if we had, you know, I'll, I'll say relatively small issues with enrollment that you could just tweak them by maybe moving a, a small group of people, but you're doubling that. I mean, 5% to 10% is huge in a school. For a um, high school, that means the superintendent you know, on his or her own volition could move 200 students with, without hearings, you know, without involving the community, without involving the board. And, and granted, a notice shall be given, but, you know, what's, what's a notice? To me, that's a so what? I, I've, I've done it or I'm going to do it. So I'm not going to support that without some significant discussion on the part of this board as to the, the potential ramifications of that. Because this, this really impacts families. And it in, impacts us as representatives of our community. 
And I think it takes away um, part of what we're responsible for in, in, in working with our communities and working with our schools. Now, granted, there, there, there is need to move students, no doubt about it, when, when schools get overcrowded because everyone suffers. But to, to unilaterally double the authority of the superintendent to do it on his own concerns me. And this has no reflection on our, our superintendent. Right. I mean, I, this is not a reflection on, you know, the current superintendent or our acting superintendent. This is just generally because I think we're abdicating. So does that mean, no, just a question, um, does that mean that the superintendent, he or she would do up to 10%, like do 10%, like you said, like um, we did that for the middle school and it was 45 kids. I don't think that the intention, what's written, 10%, and you gave the example of a high school, but I don't think a, a superintendent is going to maximize and say, okay, and, and do something and double it and say 200 kids, knowing that is that is a, a maximum and it's not good for that particular school. That's not something that a superintendent that's going to make sense to move and say, oh, I'm going to move up to 200. Well, but... I mean, it could be more than 200 because if it, it says of the involved schools. So if there were three high schools involved, it could be 600 students. And, and the fact that they may or may not do it is not the issue. The, the fact is, if this policy is changed, they will have that authority. Not that they may or may not. Okay, so it's, it's, it's us abdicating, in, in my view, yeah. you know, our responsibility for you know, for these three districts, as painful as they are. Yeah. And it, it is the most painful. So I have another question then. I thought that, uh, uh, Miss Randall, you just said that you all discussed this mm -hmm. and the recommendation was to go along with it or no? We, we added the part where the superintendent shall notify the board in advance of any adjustment. Okay. That's okay. Miss well, Healy, are you okay with that? Refresh me on who's on the governance committee. Yeah. Okay. One of the things we talked about was no. It, it should be no more than ten percent. That that if that would be, because our thoughts were with with some of the neighborhoods the way they are and some of the schools maybe being overcrowded. That he might have to move a chunk of students, and you would want everybody in the neighborhood to be moved if you could. So we were trying to give enough leeway that 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 if he had to make adjustments, he could, but he has to notify us. And it would be no more than that. 5% seem too low. 10%, I agree with you, does seem a little too high. But I can't envision that he would ever have to maximize that. It doesn't matter but, what and we I, can I, envision. I realize. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Once this policy is in place, then that is the authority. There, There is no anything other than telling you and telling right. you before or after the fact is, to me, a so what. But it, it's very interesting that two of the members have not lived through this. And maybe, maybe if you had, you, you, may, you may have three, you haven't, you've been, oh, you've been through it. Hey. We've, <laughs> oh, yes, we're all, we're, yes, we, we almost got. Let me make, no, I would imagine that, that last one. I would imagine that is, 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 is horrific okay. and painful. And I don't look forward to the possibility that it's going to occur. However, we were trying to come up with a number that was sufficient that he could accommodate an emergency or a change that had to be made. But we also recognize 10%, you're right, it is a big number, especially if you're looking at a high school or a middle school, you, you know, that is a, a, a big chunk of students. Um, but we also know that we have overcrowding issues and we have problems that are gonna be coming up down the road that may require flexibility. So, that was, I think, why we discussed no more than the 10%. I, I'm, and, I just can't, can't support this. I, look, we're taking away the right of the community to participate, you know, in these decisions and to, to have their say, as, as I said. And, and, and it, I mean, this is, it's, it's no offense, but mm -hmm. if you have not lived through this, this <laughs> agony, I'll call it, agony, because it is painful, mm -hmm. and, and we feel the pain of each family. Every one of these moves, you know, has a ripple effect. And here, here's what um, I believe the intent in general was, is to 
have some of these, believe me, there are many of these that are, have repeals, very minuscule stuff. However, there are always some that should be for full board discussion. This appears to be one of them. So I mm -hmm. believe that we will pull this out mm -hmm. for that for that one. I will tell you some of these other ones that are repeals, making sure they comply with law. We were trying to not have to have the board go through um, each of those. That Bringing them this way, we can pull out the ones that are problematic mm -hmm. and then deal with those, I think, as a separate agenda item mm -hmm. would be my suggestion, mm -hmm. trying to bring them, because um, I believe this does deserve further discussion among the board. Can, can you change that from problematic to substantive? <laughs> yeah, so, I, just... um, I know that I know that one of my um, requests for Dr. Kisner when I came on board was to look at the policies, right? Mm -hmm. And take the old policies out, if they check them, you know, bring them to us. And so my question is, are, are we, wh what is the strategy that we're doing right now? Are we doing them 10 at a time? Are we separating them in groups? I'm just trying to figure out what we're doing because this just landed. I just happened to look and I was like, oh my God, I got to read all of these. And so I just need to know what I am need to prepare for. Are we going to start getting groups of recommendation for certain? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to pull out a couple and say, these need to be discussed either in a work session like Ms. Healy or on the board or however. Like I don't want to have a slate and say, okay, this is what I'm doing. And this, this, these are the ones that you have to approve. I, I just, I just need to know. So we're going through them by section. So we have the 1000 series, 2000 series, all the way up to 9,000 series. And we're pulling and reviewing the ones that are at least or five years or older. I did have a little piece of thing here. I wrote, I forgot to read it to you. Um, reviewing all the policies. I know Ms. Boatwright took on this position and has been doing an outstanding job. I want to know how frequent we could get more policies and what the plan is. So I, I wrote that. I literally okay. wrote that before. I have to write things down sometimes, otherwise my mouth. <laughs> so that, that is the plan. But to go through these, it, it does take quite a bit of time. Okay. Um, so trying our best. Okay. So, Dr. Chase. <laughs> yeah. So I had a question. And it does involve other people as well. <laughs> um, I had a question about 2418 student vehicles. Um, over the summer, we heard from some students about the, um, that it that was upsetting to them to see hate symbols on some of the vehicles that students drove and parked in the parking lot. And so we put something in place. And I don't see anything here. And I don't know whether it would make sense to put it here as well. Um, to make sure that students understand that um, that there shouldn't be those kinds of um, bumper stickers or whatever on their vehicles. I think that whatever we may have there is covered under our student code of conduct. So it's in the student code of conduct, so we don't we wouldn't need to put it here as well as your take on it. Okay, I'm just so. just making sure. Ms. Boatwright, there was one that I saw that had uh, the microaggression in it, that mm -hmm. bullying one. Yeah. And so, um, so microaggression is the the explicit bias. <laughs> I know you can't touch on the implicit one, so I'm trying to figure out, like, is that the only? Are, are you going to be bringing like the slate of those at some point in time early, since it's the the environment is ripe for that. So I was wondering if we could look at anything that in the toolbox that you need to the policies that you need to look at. If you already looked at them, that's great. But if there's anything that you need to bring to us, would you be able to do that sooner than later? I'm just trying to get a sense of. I know you say you go through. There's certain ones that are very, very important that you need to bring even earlier. I'm um, not quite sure what you're getting at. Are you talking about a policy that we may already have? Or are you talking about new policies? I think you mentioned to Dr. Chase that um, there are some in the toolbox, in the toolkit. In the it. student code of conduct. The school of conduct. But I saw one about microaggression and bullying in here. Correct. And so what I was saying is if there are any more of that kind that you need to bring. I was wondering if we could just bring them all together since the environment is ripe 
for what's going on right now if you if you have to if there's none then that's fine so i'm trying to go through them by series and so they could be in different places so i, I okay. yeah and some of that is just um isn't our policy but is rather a, a regulation or a code of conduct so sometimes that doesn't fall for us it falls in a different place too and the code of conduct will be coming to our site that dr nichols and others that will be coming to us sometime in the next two months three months in the next two months that's what i think because if you guys will remember the state was doing part two of the changes which okay. will come in into effect for the 21 22 school year right Ms. Adams, I looked at the 14, what is it, 1403, the one Dr. Chase just brought up, and it looks to me as reading this may be a potential ambiguity because it says drivers under age 18 may carry only one passenger under age of 21. That's, that's clear. But then the next bullet says drivers who have held a license for one year may carry up to three passengers under age 21 in the following situations. So you could have a driver who was under 18, but who had their license for um, one year. So which of those applies to that person? I mean, I, I, you don't have to answer that right now, but we don't want to change our policies and create uh, potential ambiguity for both, you know, our benefit and 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 the families and the students i mean what with these policies i would think what we want to do is to be clear as to what these new changes are so maybe that's clear to somebody else and it might be it's just getting late but when i read that i don't know where that 17 year old with a, a license for a year whether they can carry whether they're restricted to one or they can inherit three if they meet those subsets so I will tell you that that came straight from the state code. Well, so to the extent we all that the know state the state code, code is, is not always clear. <laughs> so just because it's in the law doesn't mean we have to copy it, <laughs> right? <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I wanted to make sure that what we were reflecting here is what is reflected in the state law. So to the extent that there's well, some well, how would you interpret that then? Excuse me. How would you interpret it then? Drivers under the age of 18 may carry only one uh, passenger under the age of 21. So you... Uh, That's clear. Okay. But then you look at the next one. Drivers who have held a license for one year may carry up to three passengers under age 21 in the following circumstances. Um, so you could have drivers under age 18 may carry one Sounds passenger. Sounds like a math test. Drivers who have held the license for more than one year may carry... Excuse me? Yeah. No, but I mean, you could, uh, hypothetically, you could have a 17-year-old right. driver who's had their license for one year, and how many passengers mm -hmm. under age 8, 21 is... So I, I think that maybe what this is getting at is kind of what you're saying, is that if you are 17 years old and you've had your license for six months, you can only carry one passenger. If you've had your license for a year or more, you fall into this, this second bullet. But you're still in violation of the bulletin code of it. It doesn't say unless they've had their license for a, a year and then they can do the other one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to argue, I know it's late, but mm -hmm. to me, if I were a parent, I would say, gee, and, and if, if, if someone were in violation of this, I, I would try to get some clarification. Like I said, just because it's in the state law doesn't mean um, we have to to spit it back out. Um, and we can look into that. So, I think in the so it sounds like drivers under 18 may only carry one passenger, if, who have only had, had their driver's license less than a year may only carry one passenger. And then drivers who've held a license for more than one year may carry up to three. One year. Right. So I will back up the I think it's less than one year. Oh, and I usually say the clearer okay. the better. Yeah, make the year. Right. 
So there's more clarification on uh, two that have been um, highlighted here. If there are any other ones that um, people would like, some of the ones that are just repeals, things like that, we can just email. get those. I, we were, we're trying to do as much cleanup as possible, but right now we will have pulled the two, um, I think it's 1403 and was it 2418? Yep. Okay, good. I circled the right ones. They are. And so, but we can also clean it up when in, on when we bring it for the uh, next reading, we can pull those and then figure out the best vehicle for addressing the concerns on that. Send them to um, our clerk and to, um, always to Dr. Kisner and Mr. Jones. And Dr. Jones, I'm sorry. <laughs> yep, and they'll get them to the right place. All right. All right, so. Our next board meeting will be April 13th. Okay. So is, oh. These policies aren't coming all coming back for action at the next meeting, is that correct? Yeah. We, we used to always have the policies. I thought, I, what do I know? But I thought we had a policy that said we had to have two, two, readings. two informations before it could come for action. It's two, read, right. it's two readings. We, we will bring it through the right channels. I, meant, I may have missed that. Unless that policy is being changed in here. Prospectively, um, I believe it is to please know uh, board members. Our next board meeting is April 13th at seven o'clock. We, I will be um, getting back to you all on um, the location, whether we will be back in our board chambers or not, as um, has been discussed uh, okay. among all of us. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.